Chapter 31 Syncope of the Western Tradition Early Christianity The advent of Christianity marked the beginning of an unprecedented decline. In the previous pages I have emphasized the central force in Rome and its unfolding through a complex development. In the course of this development, heterogeneous influences acted only fragmentarily vis a vis the supernatural element that gave to Rome its specific physiognomy. The Rome that emancipated it itself from its aboriginal Atlantic and Etruscan Polygian roots destroyed in rapid succession the great centers of the more recent southern civilization, despised Greek philosophers and banned the Pythagorean sects, and outlawed the Bacchanalia, thus reacting against the avant-garde of the Alexandrian deities, persecutions of 59, 58, 53, 50, and 40 BC, that same Rome, that is, the sacral patrician and virile Rome inspired by the notions of Osphaz and Moss, increasingly fell under the spell of the onslaught of the Asiatic cults that rapidly infiltrated the structures of the empire and altered its physiognomy. One witnessed the return of the symbols of the mother and of the most spurious forms of the various mystical and pantheistic cults of southern deities, which were far cry from the Demetrian clarity of the origins and were associated with the corruption of the customs and of the innermost Roman virtus more than with the corruption of the institutions. This was a process of disintegration that eventually affected the imperial idea itself. The sacred content of the imperial idea was preserved, but only as a mere symbol. It was carried by a turbid and chaotic current as a chrism that really corresponded to the dignity of those who were marked by it. Historically and politically, even the representatives of the empire acted in a way that ran counter to that which would have required its defense and its reaffirmation as a solid and organic social order. Instead of reacting, selecting, and rallying the surviving elements of the Roman race around the heart of the state in order to contain adequately the new forces flowing into the empire, the Caesars began to practice an absolutist centralization and a leveling. Once the Senate lost its influence, the distinction between Roman citizens, Latin citizens, and the mass of other subjects was abolished and Roman citizenship was extended to everybody. The Caesars thought that a despotism based on military dictatorship and on a soulless bureaucratic and administrative structure could successfully hold together the Roman ecumeny, which had truly been reduced to a cosmopolitan and disarticulated mass. Nobody was able to do anything decisive to stem the general process of decadence, not even people who exhibited traits of greatness and ancient Roman dignity, who embodied some features typical of a sidereal nature and the quality of a stone, who had the sense of what true wisdom was, and who at times even received an initiatory consecration, like the Emperor Julian. The Imperial Age exhibits, in the course of its development, this contradictory double nature. On the one hand, the theology, metaphysics, and liturgy of regality became increasingly defined. On the other hand, there were plenty of references to a new golden age. Every Caesar was acclaimed with the formula expected when it. His apparition resembled a mystical event. I went to Augusta, and it was accompanied by natural wonders, just like his decline was marked by bad omens. He was the Redditrelusus Idernae Consonantis Chloris. He was again the Pontifex Magnus and the one who received from the Olympian god the universal dominion symbolized by a sphere. The crown resembling the rays of the sun and the scepter of the king of heaven were a Caesar's royal insignia. His laws were regarded as sacred or divine. Even in the Senate, the ceremony that consecrated him had a liturgical character. His image was worshipped in the temples of the various provinces, portrayed on various military standards, and regarded as the supreme reference point of the fides and of the cult of his soldiers, and as the symbol of the unity of the empire. But this was just a ray of light shining in the middle of a dark night of forces, passions, murders, cruelties, and betrayals that assumed epidemic proportions. With the passing of time, this background became increasingly tragic, bloody, and fragmentary, despite the sporadic appearance of harsh leaders who were able to command obedience and respect in a world that was weak and falling apart. Eventually, a point was reached when the imperial function existed only nominally. Rome remained faithful to it almost desperately, in a world lacerated by dreadful upheavals. And yet, the throne was vacant, so to speak. The subversive influence of Christianity added its weight to all of this. If, on the one hand, we should not ignore the complexity and the heterogeneity of the elements that were found in primitive Christianity, on the other hand, we should not minimize the existing antithesis between the dominating forces and the pathos found in these elements in the original Roman spirit. At this point I do not purport to focus on the traditional elements found in this or that historical civilization. I rather intend to assess in what function and according to what spirit the historical currents have acted as a whole.
Thus the presence of some traditional elements within Christianity, and more specifically within Catholicism, should not prevent us from recognizing the subversive character of these decurrents. We already know what kind of equivocal spirituality is associated with Judaism, from which Christianity grew, and with the Asiatic cults of decadence that facilitated the expansion of the new faith beyond its birthplace. The immediate antecedent of Christianity was not traditional Judaism, and in which the type of the warrior Messiah as an emanation of the Lord of hosts was replaced with the type of the Messiah as Son of Man predestined to be the sacrificial victim, the persecuted one, the hope of the afflicted and the rejected, as well as the object of a confused and ecstatic cult. It is a well-known fact that the mystical figure of Jesus Christ originally derived his power and inspiration from an environment impregnated with this messianic pathos the size of which grew with time as a result of prophetic preaching and various apocalyptic expectations. By regarding Jesus as Savior and by breaking away from the law, that is, from Jewish orthodoxy, primitive Christianity took up several themes typical of the Semitic soul at large. These themes were those proper to an only divided human type and constituted fertile ground for the growth of an anti-traditional virus, especially vis a vis a tradition like the Roman one. Through Paul's theology, these elements were universalized and activated without a direct relationship to their Jewish origins. As far as Orphism is concerned, it facilitated the acceptance of Christianity in several areas of the ancient world, not so much as an initiatory doctrine of the mysteries, but as its profanation paralleling the onslaught of the cults of Mediterranean decadence. These cults were characterized by the idea of salvation in a merely religious sense and by the ideal of a religion open to everyone and therefore alien to any notion of race, tradition, and caste. In other words, this ideal welcomed all those who had no race, tradition, or caste. A confused need started to grow among these masses, in concert with the parallel auction of the universalist cults of Eastern origins, until the figure of the founder of Christianity became the precipitating catalyst in the crystallization of what had been saturating the spiritual atmosphere. When this happened, it was no longer a matter of a state of mind or a widespread influence, but of a well-defined force opposing the world of tradition. From a doctrinal point of view, Christianity appears as a desperate version of Dionysism. Modeling itself after a broken human type, it appealed to the irrational part of being and instead of the paths of heroic, sapiential, and initiatory spiritual growth posited faith as its fundamental instrument. The elan of a restless and perturbed soul that is attracted to the supernatural in a confused way. Through its suggestions concerning the imminent advent of the kingdom of God and its vivid portrayals of either eternal salvation or eternal damnation, primitive Christianity exasperated the crisis of such a human type and strengthened the force of faith, thus opening a problematic path of liberation through the symbol of salvation and redemption found in the crucified Christ. If in the symbolism of Christ there are traces of a mysteric pattern, through new references to Orphism and to analogous currents. Nevertheless, the appropriate or typical feature of the new religion was the employment of such a pattern on a plane that was no longer based on initiation, but rather on feelings and on a confused mysticism. Therefore, it can rightly be said that with Christianity, God became a human being. In Christianity, we no longer find the pure religion of the law, as in traditional Judaism, nor a true initiatory mystery, but rather an intermediate form, a surrogate of the latter in a formulation proper to the above-mentioned broken human type. This type felt relieved from his abd, redeemed through the feeling of grace, animated by a new hope, justified and rescued from the world, the flesh, and from death. All of this represented something fundamentally alien to the Roman and classical spirit, better yet, to the Indo-European spirit as a whole. Historically, this signified the predominance of pathos over ethos and of that equivocal, efficient soteriology that had always been opposed by the noble demeanor of the sacred Roman patriciate, by the strict style of the jurists, the leaders, and the pagan sages. God was no longer conceived of as the symbol of an essence not liable to passion and change which establishes an umbrid distance between itself and all that is merely human. Nor was he the god of the patricians who is invoked in an erect position, who is carried in front of the legions and who becomes embodied in the winner. The god who came to be worshipped was a figure who in his passion took up and affirmed in an exclusivist fashion, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Psalm 14, 6-7, the Pelagic Dionysian motif of the sacrificed gods and the gods who die and rise again in the shadow of the great mothers.
Even the myth of the virginal birth reflects an analogous influence, since it reminds us of the goddesses who generate without a mate, like Hesiod's Gia. In this regard, the relevant role that the cult of the Mother of God or the Divine Virgin was destined to play in the development of Christianity is significant. In Catholicism, Mary, the Mother of God, is the Queen of Angels and of all the saints. She is also thought of as the adoptive Mother of Mankind, as the Queen of the World, and as the bestower of all favors. These expressions, which are exaggerated in comparison to the effective role played by Mary in the myth of the Synoptic Gospels, echo the attributes of the sovereign divine mothers of the pre-Indo-European Southern Hemisphere. Although Christianity is essentially a religion of the Christ, more so than of the Father, its representations of both the infant Jesus and the body of the crucified Christ in the arms of the deified mother show definite similarities with the representations of the Eastern Mediterranean cults thereby giving new emphasis to the antithesis that exists between itself and the ideal of the purely Olympian deities who are exempt from passions and free of the telluric, maternal element. The symbol that the Church herself eventually adopted was that of the Mother, Mother Church. The epitome of true religiosity being that of the imploring and prayerful soul that is aware of its unworthiness, sinfulness, and powerlessness before the crucified one. The hatred early Christian and he felt toward any form of virile spirituality, and its stigmatization as folly and sin of pride anything that may promote an active overcoming of the human condition express in a clear fashion its lack of understanding of the heroic symbol. The potential that the new faith was able to generate among those who felt the lived mystery of the Christ or of the Savior and who drew from it the inner strength to pursue martyrdom frantically does not prevent the advent of Christianity from representing a fall. Its advent characterized a special form of that spiritual emasculate typical of the cycles of a lunar and priestly type. Even in Christian morality, the role played by southern and non-Aaron influences is rather visible. It does not really make much of a difference that it was in the name of a god instead of a goddess that equality among human beings was spiritually proclaimed and that love was adopted as the supreme principle. This belief in human equality essentially belongs to a general worldview, a version of which is that natural law that crept into the Roman law during decadent times. It exercised an antithetical function to the heroic ideal of personality and to the value bestowed on anything that a being, by becoming differentiated, by giving itself a form, is able to claim for itself within a hierarchical social order. And so it happened that Christian egalitarianism, based on the principles of brotherhood, love, and community, became the mystical and religious foundation of a social ideal radically opposed to the pure Roman idea. Instead of universality, which is authentic only in its function as a hierarchical peak that does not abolish but presupposes and sanctions the differences among human beings. What arose was the ideal of collectivity reaffirmed in the symbol of the mystical body of Christ. This latter ideal contained an embryonic form of further regressive and involutive influence that Catholicism itself, despite its Romanization, was neither at will nor entirely willing to overcome. Some people attempt to see a value in Christianity as a doctrine because of its idea of the supernatural and the dualism that it upheld. Here, however, we find a typical case of a different action that the same principle can exercise according to the function under which it is assumed. Christian dualism essentially derives from the dualism proper to the Semitic spirit. It acted in a totally opposite way from the spirit according to which the doctrine of the two natures constituted the basis of any achievement of traditional humanity. In early Christianity, the rigid opposition of the natural and supernatural orders may have had a pragmatic justification motivated by a particular historical and existential situation of a given human type. Such dualism differs from the traditional dualism, however, in that it is not subordinated to a higher principle or to a higher truth, and that it claims for itself an absolute and ontological character rather than a relative and functional one. The two orders, the natural and the supernatural, as well as the distance between them, were hypostatized and thus any real and active contact was prevented from taking place. Thus, in regard to man, here to because of a parallel influence of a Jewish theme, what emerged were, eh, the notion of the creature separated by an essential distance from God as its creator and as a personal, distinct being, and b, the exasperation of this distance through the revival and the accentuation of the idea, of Jewish origins as well, of original sin. More particularly, this dualism generated the understanding of all manifestations of spiritual influence in the passive terms of grace, election, and salvation, as well as the disarray, at times accompanied by real animosity, of all heroic human possibilities, the counterpart of this disarray consisted in humility, fear of God, mortification of the flesh, and prayer.
Jesus saying in Matthew 11, 12, Concerning the violence suffered by the kingdom of heaven in the revival of the Davidic saying, You are gods, John 10, 34, belong to elements that exercise virtually no influence on the main pathos of early Christianity. But in Christianity in general, it is evident that what has been universalized, rendered exclusive, and exalted all the way, the truth, and the attitude that pertain only to an inferior human type or to those lower strait of a society for whom the exoteric forms of tradition have been devised, this was precisely one of the characteristic signs of the climate of the Dark Age, or Kali Yuga. What has been said concerns the relationship of man with the divine. The second consequence of Christian dualism was the deconsecration of nature. Christian supernaturalism caused the natural myths of antiquity to be misunderstood once and for all. Nature ceased to be something living. That magical and symbolic perception of nature that formed the basis of priestly sciences was rejected and branded as pagan. Following the triumph of Christianity, these sciences underwent a rapid process of degeneration, with the exception of a weakened residue represented by the later Catholic tradition of the rites. Thus, Nietzsche came to be perceived as something alien and even diabolical. Again, this constituted the basis for the development of an asceticism of a monastic and mortified type, hostile to the world and to life, Christian asceticism, and radically antithetical to the classical and Roman sensibility. The third consequence concerns the political domain. The principles, My kingdom is not of this world, John 18.36, and Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's, Matthew 20-21, represented a direct attack on the concept of traditional sovereignty and of that unity of the two powers that had formerly been re-established in imperial Rome. According to Jelly CSI, after Christ, no man can simultaneously be king and priest. The unity of Sacerdotum and Marengum, when it is vindicated by a king, is a diabolical deception and a counterfeit of the true priestly regality that belongs to Christ alone. It was precisely at this point that the contrast between Christian and Roman ideas escalated into an open conflict. When Christianity developed, the Roman pantheon was so inclusive that even the cult of the Christian savior could have found its proper place within it, among other cults, as a particular cult derived from a schism in Judaism. As I have previously suggested, it was typical of the imperial universalism to exercise a higher unifying and organizing function over and above any particular cult, which it did not need to deny or to oppose. What was required, though, was an act demonstrating a superdained fide in reference to the principle, from above embodied in the representative of the empire, namely in the Augustus. The Christians refused to perform this very act, consisting of a ritual and sacrificial offering made before the imperial symbol, since they claimed that it was incompatible with their faith. This was the only reason why there was such an epidemic of martyrs, which may have appeared as pure folly in the eyes of the Roman magistrates. In this way, the new belief imposed itself. The Civitas Dei, or the Divine State, was thought to belong to a separate plane and to consist in the unity of those who are drawn to the other world by a confused longing and who, as Christians, acknowledge only Christ as their leader as they await the last day. It merely had the value of a contingent obedience to a power that was merely temporal. The Pauline saying, all authority comes from God, was destined to remain ineffectual and meaningless. And thus, although Christianity upheld the spiritual and supernatural principle, historically speaking this principle was destined to act in a dissa and even destructive fashion. It did not represent something capable of galvanizing whatever in the Roman world had become materialized and fragmented, but rather represented something heterogeneous. A different current drawn to what in Rome was no longer Roman into forces that the northern light had successfully kept under control for the duration of an entire cycle. It helped to rescind the last contacts and to accelerate the end of a great tradition. It is not surprising that rudely Islamishanists put Christians and Jews on the same level. Insofar as both groups were hostile to Rome's authority, he also blamed the former for spreading a fatal disease, Exocci Pestis Contigai, outside the boundaries of Judea, which was under the legion's yoke, and the latter for spreading a poison that altered both the race and the spirit, Tunquemai Binter Corpora Ninkainema. When considering the enigmatic witnesses offered by ancient symbols, one cannot help noticing the role of the motif of the S played in the myth of Jesus. Not only was the S present in the nativity scene, but it was on an S that the Virgin and the Divine Child escaped to Egypt. Most of all, it was on an S that Jesus rode during his triumphal entrance into Jerusalem. The S was a traditional symbol of an infernal dissolutive force.
In Egypt, it was the animal sacred to Set, who embodied this force, had an anti-solar character, and was associated with the children of the powerless rebellion. In India, the S was the Mount of Medivhi, who represented the infernal aspect of the feminine deity. Also, in Greece, the S was the symbolic animal that in Les Plain continuously ate Ochnus annuar, and that had a relationship with the Thonic and infernal goddess Hecate. This is how this symbol could represent the secret sign of a force that was associated with primitive Christianity into which it partially owed its success. It was the force that emerged and assumed an active part wherever what corresponded to the cosmos principle within a traditional structure vacillated and disintegrated. In reality, the advent of Christianity would not have been possible if the vital possibilities of the Roman heroic cycle had not been exhausted. If the Roman race had not been broken in its spirit and in its representatives, a proof of this was the failure of the attempted restoration promoted by Emperor Julian, if the ancient traditions had not been dimmed, and if, in the context of an ethic chaos and a cosmopolitan disintegration, the imperial symbol had not been contaminated and reduced to merely surviving in a world of ruins. Chapter 32 The Revival of the Empire in the Ghibelin Middle Ages the tradition that shaped the Roman world manifested its power vis a vis Christianity in the fact that, although the new faith was successful in overthrowing the ancient civilization, it nevertheless was not able to conquer the Western world as pure Christianity. Wherever it achieved some greatness, it did so only thanks to Roman and classical pre-Christian elements borrowed from the previous tradition, and not because of the Christian element in its original form. For all practical purposes, Christianity converted Western men only superficially. It constituted his faith in the most abstract sense while his real life continued to obey the more or less material forms of the opposite tradition of action. And later on, during the Middle Ages, an ethos that was essentially shaped by the Northern Aryan spirit. In theory, the Western world accepted Christianity, but for all practical purposes it remained pagan. The fact that Europe was able to incorporate so many motifs that were connected with the Jewish and Levantine view of life has always been a source of surprise among historians. Thus, the outcome was some sort of hybridism. Even in its attenuated and Romanist Catholic version, the Christian faith represented an obstacle that deprived Western man of the possibility of integrating his authentic and irrepressible way of being through a concept and in a relationship with the sacred that was most congenial to him. In turn, this way of being prevented Christianity from definitely shaping the West into a tradition of the opposite kind, that is, into a priestly and religious one conformed to the ideals of the Ecclesia of the Origins, the Evangelical Pathos, and the symbol of the mystical body of Christ. Further on, I will closely analyze the effects of this double antithesis on the course of Western history. Strictly speaking, this antithesis represented an important factor in the processes leading to the modern world. In a particular cycle, however, the Christian idea, in those concepts in which the supernatural was emphasized, seemed to have become absorbed by the Roman idea in forms that again elevated the imperial idea to new heights, even though the tradition of this idea, found in the center constituted by the Eternal City, had by then decayed. Such was the Byzantine cycle or the cycle of the Eastern Roman Empire. What occurred in the East, however, corresponded to what had previously occurred in the Low Empire, the Byzantine imperial idea displayed a high degree of traditional spirit, at least theoretically. For instance, it upheld the ideal of the sacred rule of Prasile Sadagritur, whose authority came from above and whose law, reflecting the divine law, had a universal value. Also the clergy was subjected to him because the emperor was in charge of both temporal and spiritual affairs. Likewise, in the Eastern Empire the idea of the Romani, the Romans, took hold and came to represent the unity of those who were elevated by the chrism inherent in the participation in the Roman Christian ecumening to a dignity higher than any other people ever achieved. The empire once again was said and his pacts had a supernatural meaning. And yet, even more so than during the Roman decadence, all this remained a symbol carried by chaotic and murky forces, since the ethic substance was characterized, much more so than in the previous imperial Roman cycle, by demon worship, anarchy, and the principle of undying restlessness typical of the decadent and crepuscular Hellenic Eastern world. Here, too, the Byzantine emperors incorrectly assumed that despotism in a bureaucratic, Centralized administrative structure could achieve that which only proceeds from the spiritual authority of worthy representatives who surround themselves with people who had the quality of Romans, not just nominally, but imprinted in their inner character. Therefore the forces of dissolution were destined to prevail, even though Byzantium lasted as a political reality for about a millennium. What remained of the Byzantine Roman Christian idea were mere echoes, partially absorbed in a very modified form by Slavic peoples and partially brought together again in that revival of tradition constituted by the Ghibelin Middle Ages.
In order to follow the development of forces that shaped the Western world, it is necessary to briefly consider Catholicism. Catholicism developed through a the rectification of various extremist features of primitive Christianity, b. the organization of a ritual, dogmatic, and symbolic corpus beyond the mere mystical, sotological element, and c. the absorption and adaptation of doctrinal and organizational elements that were borrowed from the Roman world and from classical civilization in general. This is how Catholicism at times displayed traditional features which nevertheless should not deceive us. That which in Catholicism has a truly traditional character is not typically Christian, and that which in Catholicism is specifically Christian can hardly be considered traditional. Historically, despite all the efforts that were made to reconcile heterogeneous and contradictory elements, and despite the work of absorption and adaptation on a large scale, Catholicism always betrays the spirit of Lunar, priestly civilizations, and thus it continues in yet another form, the antagonistic action of the southern influences, to which it offered a real organization through the church and her hierarchy. This becomes evident when we examine the development of the principle of authority that was claimed by the church. During the early centuries of the Christianized empire and during the Byzantine period, the church still appeared to be subordinated to imperial authority. At church councils, the bishops left the last word to the ruler not only in disciplinary but also in doctrinal matters. Gradually, the shift occurred to the belief in the equality of the two powers of church and empire. Both institutions came to be regarded as enjoying a supernatural authority and a divine origin. With the passage of time we find in the Carolingian ideal the principle according to which the king is supposed to rule over both clergy and the people on the one hand, while on the other hand the ideal was developed according to which the royal function was compared to that of the body and the priestly function to that of the soul. Thereby the idea of the equality of the two powers was implicitly abandoned, thus preparing the way for the real inversion of relations. By analogy, if in every rational being the soul is the principle that decides what the body will do, how could one think that those who admitted to having authority only in matters of social and political concern should not be subordinated to the church, to whom they willingly recognize the exclusive right over and direction of souls? Thus, the church eventually disputed and regarded as tantamount to heresy and a prevarication dictated by pride that doctrine of the divine nature and origin of regality. It also came to regard the ruler as a mere layman equal to all other men before God and his church, and a mere official invested by mortal beings with the power to rule over others in accordance with natural law. According to the church, the ruler should receive from the ecclesiastical hierarchy the spiritual element that prevents his government from becoming the civitas diabol. Boniface VIII, he did not hesitate to ascend to the throne of Constantine with a sword, crown, and scepter and to declare, I am Caesar, I am the emperor embodies the logical conclusion of theocratic, southern upheaval in which the priest was entrusted with both evangelical swords, the spiritual and the temporal. The MP itself came to be regarded as a beneficum conferred by the Pope to somebody, who in return owed to the Church the same vassalage and obedience of feudal vassals the person who has invested him. However, since the spirituality that the head of the Roman Church in Cana remained in its essence that of the servants of God, we can say that far from representing the restoration of the primordial and solar unity of the two powers, Lisa merely testifies to how Rome had lost its ancient tradition and how it came to represent the opposite principle in the triumph of the southern Weltanschauung in Europe. In the confusion that was beginning to affect even the symbols, the Church, who on the one hand claimed for herself the symbol of the sun vis a vis the empire, to which she attributed the symbol of the moon, on the other hand employed the symbol of the mother to refer to herself and considered the emperor as one of her children. The Guelph ideal of political supremacy marked the return to the ancient Ginkaratic vision in which the authority, superiority, and privilege of spiritual primacy was accorded to the maternal principle over the male principle, which was then associated with the temporal and ephemeral reality. Thus, a change occurred. The Roman idea was revived by races of a direct northern origin, which various migrations had pushed into the area of Roman civilization. The Germanic element was destined to defend the imperial idea against the church and to restore to new life the formative vis of the ancient Roman world. This is how the Holy Roman Empire and the feudal civilization arose, both of which represented the two last great traditional manifestations the West ever knew. As far as the Germans were concerned, since the times of Tacitus they appeared to be very similar to the Achaean, Paleo-Ranian, Paleo-Roman and Northern Aryan stocks that had been preserved, in many aspects, including the racial one, in a state of prehistoric purity.
The German populations, just like the Goths, the Longobards, the Burgundians, and the Franks, were looked down upon as barbarians by that decadent civilization that had been reduced to a juridical administrative structure that had degenerated into aphoristic forms of hedonistic urban refinement, intellectualism, aestheticism, and cosmopolitan dissolution. And yet, in the coarse and unsophisticated forms of their customs, one could find the expression of an existence characterized by the principles of honor, faithfulness, and pride. It was precisely this barbaric element that represented a vital force, the lack of which had been one of the main causes of Roman and Byzantine decadence. The fact that the ancient Germans were young races has prevented many scholars from seeing the full picture of earlier antiquity. These races were young only because of the youth typical of that which still maintains contact with the origins. These races descended from the last offshoots to leave the Arctic Sea and that therefore had not suffered the mised and the alterations experienced by similar populations that had abandoned the Arctic Sea much earlier, as is the case with the Paleo-Indo-European stocks that had settled in the prehistoric Mediterranean. The Nordic Germanic people, besides their ethos, carried in their midst the traces of a tradition that derived immediately from the primordial tradition. The fact that during the period in which they appeared as decisive forces on the stage of European history these stocks lost the memory of their origins, and that the primordial tradition was present in those stocks only in the form of fragmentary, often altered and unrefined residues, did not prevent them from carrying as a deep, inner legacy the possibilities and the acquired Weltanschauung from which heroic cycles derive. The myth of the Eddas spoke about both the impending doom and the heroic will opposed to it. In the older parts of that myth there remained the memory of a deep freeze that arrested the twelve streams originating from the primordial and luminous center of Musbilaim, located at the far end of the earth. This center corresponds to the area of Ego, the Iranian equivalent of the Hyperborean seat, to the radiant northern island of the Hindus, and to the other figurations of the seat of the Golden Age. Moreover, the Ida mentioned a Greenland floating on the abyss and surrounded by the ocean. According to some traditions, this was the original location of the fallen of dark and tragic times, since it was here that the warm current of the Muspelheim. In this order of traditional mist, the waters represent the force that gives life to people and to races, met the frigid current of Virgerm. Just as in the Zendavis to the freezing and dark winter that depopulated Arian Vega was conceived as the work of an evil god opposed to the luminous creation. Likewise, this eddy myth may allude to the alteration that precipitated the new cycle. This is true especially if we consider that the myth mentions a generation of giants and elemental telluric beings, creatures that were defrosted by the warm current, and against whom the race of the Esses is going to fight. In the Edda, the theme of Ragnarok or Ragnarok, the destiny or the twilight of the gods, is the equivalent of the traditional teaching concerning the four-stage involutive process. It threads a struggling world, which is already dominated by dualistic thinking. From an esoteric point of view, this twilight affects the gods only metaphorically. It also signifies the dimming of the gods in human consciousness because mankind loses the gods, that is, the possibility of establishing a contact with them. Such a destiny may be avoided, however, by preserving the purity of the deposit of that primordial and symbolic element, gold, with which the palace of the heroes, the Hall of Odin's Twelve Thra, was built in the mythical Asgard. This gold, which could act as a source of good health so long as it was not touched by an elemental or by a human being, eventually fell into the hands of Albercus, the king of the subterranean beings that in the later editing of the myth are called the Nibilings. This clearly shows the echo of what in other traditions was the advent of the Bronze Age, the cycle of the Titanic Promethean Rebellion, which was probably connected with the magical involution in the inferior sense of previous cults. Over and against this stands the world of the Assez, the Nordic Germanic deities who embody the Rainian principle in its warrior aspect. The god Darnar Thor was the slayer of Thim and Hymir, the strongest of all, the irresistible, the lord who rescues from terror, whose fearful weapon, the double hammer Mjolnir, was both a variation of the symbolic Hyperborean battle axe and a sign of the thunderbolt force proper to the Rainian gods of the Aryan cycle. The god Wadden Odin was he who granted victory and who had wisdom. He was the master of very powerful formulae that were not to be revealed to any woman, not even to the king's daughter. He was the eagle, he was the host and the father of the dead heroes who were selected by the Valkyries on the battlefields. It was he who bestowed on the noble ones that spirit that lives on and which does not die when the body is dissolved into the earth, and he was the deity to whom the royal stocks attributed their origin.
the god Diretius was another god of battles, and the god of the day, of the radiant solar sky, who was represented by the Runwai, which recalls the very ancient and northern Atlantic sign of the cosmic man with his hands raised. One of the motifs of the heroic cycles appears in the saga concerning the stock of the Welson, which was generated from the union of a god with a woman. Sigmund, who will one day extract the sword inserted in the divine tree, came from this stock. In this saga, the hero Sigurd or Siegfried, after taking possession of the gold that had fallen into the hands of the Nibblings, kills the dragon Fafnir, which is another form of the serpent Anu. This serpent, in the action of corroding the roots of the divine tree Yggdrasil, its collapse will mark the twilight of the race of the gods, personifies the dark power of decadence. Although Sigurd in the end is killed by treachery and the gold is returned to the waters, he nevertheless remains the heroic type endowed with the tan cap, the symbolic power that can transfer a person from the bodily dimension to the invisible, and predestined to possess the divine woman either in the form of a vanquished Amazonian queen, Brynhild, as the queen of the northern island, or in the form of a Valkyrie, a warrior virgin who went from an earthly to a divine seat. The oldest Nordic stocks regarded Gardrick the land located in the far north, as their original homeland, the seat, even when it was identified with the Scandinavian region, was associated with the echo of the polar function of MIT guard of the primordial center. This was a transposition of memories from the physical to the metaphysical dimension by virtue of which Gardrick was also identified with Asgard. Asgard allegedly was the dwelling place of non-human ancestors of the noble Nordic families, in Osgard, Scandinavian sacred kings such as Gilfir, who had gone there to proclaim their power, allegedly received the traditional teaching of the Edo. Osgard was also a sacred land, the land of the Nordic Olympian gods and of the Ases, access to which was precluded to the race of the giants. These motifs were found in the traditional legacy of Nordic Germanic populations. As a view of the world, the insight into the outcome of the decline, Ragnaraka, was associated with ideals and with figurations of gods who are typical of heroic cycles. As I have said, in more recent times this was a subconscious legacy. The supernatural element became obscured by secondary and spurious elements of the myth and the saga, as did the universal element contained in the idea of Oscar to my tea guard, the center of the world. The contact of Germanic people with the Roman and Christian world had a double effect. On the one hand, their invasion resulted in a devastation of the material structure of the empire, while from an internal point of view it turned out to be a vivifying contribution that eventually established the presuppositions of a new and virile civilization destined to reaffirm the Roman symbol. In later times, in the same way, an essential rectification of Christianity and Catholicism took place, especially with regard to a general view of life. On the other hand, both the idea of Roman universalism and the Christian principle, in its generic aspect of affirmation of a supernatural order, produced an awakening of the highest vocation of Nordic Germanic stock. Both ideas also contributed to the integration on a higher plane and to the revivification in a new form of what had often been materialized and particularized in them in the context of traditions of individual races. Conversion to the Christian faith, more than altering the Germanic stock strength, often purified it and prepared it for a revival of the imperial Roman idea. Many centuries ago, during the coronation of the king of the Franks, the formula Renawire Romani Impera was spoken. Not only did they identify Rome as the symbolic source of their impian of the right, but the Germanic princes also ended up siding against the hegemonic commands of the church. Thus they became the protagonist of a great new historical movement that promoted a traditional restoration. From a political perspective, the congenital ethos of the Germanic races conferred to the imperial reality a living, stable, and differentiated character. The life of the ancient Nordic Germanic societies was based on the three principles of personality, freedom, and faithfulness. This life never knew the promiscuous sense of the community nor the inability of the individual to make the most of himself other than in the context of a given abstract institution. In these societies, to be free was the measure of one's nobility. And yet this freedom was not anarchical and individualistic, but it was capable of a dedication that went beyond the person, and it knew the transfiguring value that characterized the principle of faithfulness toward one who is worthy of obedience and to whom people willingly submit themselves. Thus, groups of devoted subjects rallied around leaders to whom the ancient saying did apply. The supreme nobility of a Roman emperor does not consist in being a master of slaves but in being a lord of free men, who loves freedom even in those who serve him. Also the state, almost like in the ancient Roman aristocratic concept, was centered on the council of leaders, each member being a free man, the lord of his lands, and the leader of the group of his faithful, 
Beyond this council, the unity of the state and, to a degree, its superpolitical aspect was embodied by the king since he belonged, unlike mere military leaders, to one of the stocks of divine origin. The Goths, for example, called the kings of Mals the pure ones or the heavenly ones. Originally, the material and spiritual unity of the nation was manifested only in the event of a particular action or the realization of a common mission, especially an offensive or defensive one. And in that circumstance, a new condition set in. Next to the king, a leader, dux, or each saga was elected, and a new rigid hierarchy was spontaneously established. The free man became the leader's immediate subordinate. The latter's authority allowed him to take the life of his subject if he failed in his duties. According to the testimony left to us by Tacitus, the prime obligation of the Yantara's allegiance is to protect and guard him and to credit their own brave deeds to his glory. The chieftains fight for victory, the Yantara's for the chieftain. Once the mission was accomplished, the original independence and pluralism were re-established. The Scandinavian counts called their leader the enemy of gold, since as a leader he was not allowed to keep any gold for himself, and also the host of heroes because of the pride he took in hosting his faithful warriors, whom he regarded as his companions and equals, in his house, even among the Franks prior to Charlemagne. Participation in a particular mission occurred on a voluntary basis. The king invited people to participate, he appealed to them. At times the princes themselves proposed a course of action, in any event, there was neither duty nor personal service, since everywhere there were free and highly personalized relationships of command and obedience, mutual understanding and faithfulness. Thus, the idea of free personality was the foundation of any unity and hierarchy. This was the Nordic seed from which the feudal system arose as the background to the new imperial idea. The development that led to such a regime began with the convergence of the ideas of king and leader. The king became the embodiment of the unity of the group even in time of peace. This was possible through the strengthening and the extension of the warrior principle of faithfulness to times of peace. A group of faithful retainers, e.g., the Nordic Huskarlor, the Longwebrid Geisinde, the Gothic Palatines, the Frank Entrustians or Conway Regis, consisting of free men, gathered around the king. These people regarded being in the service of their lord in the defense of his honor and right as both a privilege and a realization of a way of being more elevated than if they were merely answerable to no one but themselves. The feudal constitution was realized through the progress of extension of this principle, originally manifested in the Frank royalty, to various elements of the community. During the period of conquests, a second aspect of the above-mentioned development took place. The bestowal of conquered lands as feast in return for the commitment to faithfulness. The Frank mobility spread into areas that did not coincide with those of any given nation and became a bonding and unifying element. From a formal point of view, this development appeared to involve an alteration of the previous constitution. The rule over a fief was regarded as a regal benefit contingent upon loyalty and service to the king. In reality, the feudal regime was a principle to be followed rather than a rigid reality. It was the general idea of an organic law of order that left ample room for the dynamic interaction of free forces fighting either side by side or against each other, without attenuations or alterations, subject before a lord, lord before a lord, and that caused everything, freedom, honor, glory, destiny, property, to be based on bravery and on the personal factor since nothing or virtually nothing was based on a collective element, public power, or abstract law. As it has rightfully been remarked, in the feudal system of the origins the fundamental and distinctive feature of regality was not that of a public power, but rather that of forces that were in the presence of other forces, each one responsible to itself for its own authority and dignity. Never has man been treated so harshly as in the feudal system, and yet not only for the feudal lords who had the responsibility of protecting their rights and honor, but also for the subjects this regime was a school of independence and of virility rather than of servility. In this regime the relationships of faithfulness and of honor played a larger role than in any other western time period. Generally speaking, in this type of society, beyond the promiscuity of the lower empire and the chaos of the period of the invasions, everybody was able to find the place appropriate to his own nature, as is always the case wherever we find an immaterial catalyst within the social organism. For the last time in Western history, the quadrupartition of society into serfs, merchants, warrior nobility, and representatives of spiritual authority, the clergy and the Guelph and the ascetic, knightly orders and the Gibbelin system, took form and affirmed itself in an almost spontaneous way.
The fact that the feudal world of personality and of action did not exhaust the deepest possibilities of medieval man was proven by the fact that his fides was able to develop in a sublimate form and be purified into the universal. Such was the form that had the empire as its reference point. The empire was perceived as a super-political reality, an institution of supernatural origin that formed one power with the divine kingdom. While in the empire the same spirit that shaped the individual feudal and regal units continued to act, its peak was the emperor, who was regarded not as a mere man, but rather as a deus homo tots deficatse ti sanctificacta diarandis quae praesul princeps et somasist, according to the characteristic expression of the time. Thus, the emperor embodied the function of a center in the eminent sense of the word and demanded from his subjects and from the feudal lords a spiritual acknowledgement similar to what the church claimed for herself in order to realize a higher European traditional unity. Since the sons cannot coexist in the same planetary system, and since the image of the two sons was often applied to the duality of church and empire, the struggle between these two universal powers, which were the supreme reference points of the great ordinado a unum of the feudal world, was bound to erupt. On both sides there were compromises and more or less conscious concessions to the opposing principle. The meaning of such a struggle, however, eludes both those who stop at a superficial level and at everything that from a metaphysical point of view is regarded as a mere occasional cause. Thus seeing in it only a political competition and a clash of interests and ambitions rather than a material and spiritual struggle. And those who regard this conflict as one between two opponents who are fighting over the same thing, each claiming the prerogative of the same type of universal power. On the contrary, the struggle hides the contrast between two incompatible visions. This contrast points once again to the antithesis of north and south, of solar and lunar spirituality. The universal ideal of a religious kind advocated by the church is opposed to the imperial ideal, which consists in a secret tendency to reconstruct the unity of the two powers, of the regal and the high, or the sacred and the virile. Although the imperial idea and its external expressions often claim for itself the dominion of the corpus and of the order of the medieval ecumeny, and although the emperors often embodied in a mere formal way the living lex and subjected themselves to an asceticism of power, the idea of sacred regality appeared yet again on a universal plane. Wherever history hinted only implicitly at this higher aspiration, it was the myth that bespoke it. The myth was not opposed to history, but rather revealed its deeper dimension. I have previously suggested that in the medieval imperial legend there are numerous elements that refer more or less directly to the idea of the supreme center. These elements, through various symbols, allude to a mysterious relation between the center and the universal authority and legitimacy of the Ghibelin Emperor. The objects symbolizing initiatic regality were entrusted to him and at times the motif of the hero, who never died and who had been brought to a mountain or to a subterranean seat was applied to him and the emperor dwelt the force that was expected to reawaken at the end of a cycle, cause the dry tree to bloom, and assist him in the last battle against Gog and Mike's onslaught. Especially in relation to the Hohenschaufen, the idea of a divine and Roman stock asserted itself. This stock was believed not only to be in charge of the regnum, but also to be able to penetrate the mysteries of God, which other people can only perceive vaguely through images. The counterpart of all this was a secret spirituality, See chapter 14, that was typical of yet another high point of the Ghibelin and feudal world, chivalry. By producing chivalry, that world demonstrated once again the efficiency of a superior principle. Chivalry was the natural complement of the imperial idea. Between these two, there was the same relationship as existed between the clergy and the church. Chivalry was like a race of the spirit in which the purity of blood played an important role as well. The northern Aryan element present in it was purified until it reached a universal type and ideal in terms that corresponded to what the Quilus Romanus had originally been in the world. Even in chivalry we can distinctively see the extent to which the fundamental themes of early Christianity had been overcome and how the church herself was forced to sanction, or at least to tolerate, a complex of principles, values, and customs that can hardly be reconciled with the spirit of her origins. Without repeating what has been said previously, I would like to recap the main points. Within a nominally Christian world, chivalry upheld without any substantial alterations in Aryan ethics in the following things. 1. Upholding the ideal of the hero rather than of the saint, and of the conqueror rather than of the martyr. 2. Regarding faithful and sin honor rather than caritas and humba as the highest virtues. 3. Regarding cowardice and dishonor rather than sin as the worst possible evil. 
4. Ignoring or hardly putting into practice the evangelical precepts of not opposing evil and not retaliating against offenses, but rather, methodically punishing unfairness and evil. 5. Excluding from its ranks those who followed the Christian precept, thou shalt not kill to the letter, and 6. Refusing to love one's enemy and instead fighting him and being magnanimous only after defeating him. Secondly, the test of arms that consisted in settling all disputes through strength, regarded as a virtue entrusted by God to man in order to promote the triumph of justice, truth, and the law here on earth, became a fundamental idea that reached far beyond the context of feudal honor and law into the context of theology, in which it was applied under the name of God's ordeal. Even in matters of faith, this idea was not really a Christian one. It was rather inspired by the mystical doctrine of victory that ignored the dualism proper to religious views, united spirit and might, and sought in victory some sort of divine consecration. The theistic watered-down version of this doctrine, according to which during the Middle Ages people usually thought that victory was brought about by a direct intervention of God, did not affect the innermost spirit of these customs. If chivalry professed faithfulness to the church as well many elements to suggest that this was a devotion similar to that attributed to various ideals and to the woman to whom a knight committed his own life. What really mattered to the knight and to his way was a generic attitude of heroic subordination of both his happiness and his life, rather than the issue of faith in a specific and theological sense. I have already suggested that both chivalry and the Crusades, besides their outer and exoteric aspect, also had an esoteric dimension. As far as chivalry is concerned, I have already mentioned that it had its mysteries, a temple that most definitely did not correspond to the Church of Rome, and a literature and sagas in which ancient pre-Christian traditions became alive again. Among these things, the most characteristic was the saga of the Grail because of the emergence within it of the theme of initiatic reintegration, the goal of which was to restore a fallen kingdom. This theme developed a secret language that often concealed an uttermost disdain for the Roman courier. Even within the great historical knightly orders, which were characterized by the peculiar tendency to reunite the types of the warrior and the ascetic, we find underground currents that, whenever they surface, brought upon these orders the suspicion and persecution of the official religion. In reality, chivalry was animated by the impulse toward a traditional restoration in the highest sense of the word. With the silent or explicit overcoming of the Christian religious spirit, see for instance the symbolic ritual of the rejection of the cross allegedly practiced among the Knights Templar. The ideal center of all this was the empire. This is how the legends arose that revived the theme of the dry tree, the blossoming of which was attributed to an emperor who will wage war against the clergy, so much so that at times he came to be regarded as the anticrime. See, for instance, the compendium Talagai. This was, on the part of the church, an obscure and distorted expression of the perception of a spirituality reconcilable with the Christian spirituality. In the period in which victory seemed to be within the grasp of Frederick II, popular prophecies claim, the tall cedar of Lebanon will be cut down. There will only be one god, namely, a monarch. Woe to the clergy, if it ever falls, a new order is ready to be implemented. During the Crusades, for the first and only time in post-Roman Europe, the ideal of the unity of nations, represented in peacetime by the empire, was achieved on the plane of action in the wake of a wonderful lawn, and as if in a mysterious reenactment of the great prehistoric movement from north to south and from west to east. The analysis of the deep forces that produced and directed the Crusades does not fit in with the ideas typical of a two-dimensional historiography. In the movement toward Jerusalem what often became manifested was an occult current against papal Rome that was fostered by Rome itself. In this current chivalry is the militia and the heroic cable and ideal was the livelous force. This current culminated in an emperor who was stigmatized by Gregory IX as one who threatens to replace the Christian faith with the ancient rites of the pagan populations, and who by sitting in the temple usurps the functions of the priesthood. The figure of Godfrey of Buon, the most significant representative of crusader chivalry, who was called Lux Marcorn, which again reveals the ascetical and warrior element proper to this knightly aristocracy, was that of a Ghibelin prince who ascended to the throne of Jerusalem after visiting Rome with blood and iron, killing the anti-Caesar Rudolf of Reinefeld and expelling the Pope from the Holy City. The legend also established a meaningful kinship between this king of the crusaders and the mythical knight of the swan. The French Halias, the Germanic Lohengrin, who in turn embodies symbols that were imperially Roman, 
His symbolic genealogical descent from Caesar himself, Solar, the etymological relation between existing between Helias, Helias, and Elijah, and Hyperborean, the swan that leads Lohengrin from the heavily seed was also the animal representing Apollo among the Hyperboreans and a recurrent theme in paleographic traces of the northern Aryan cult. The body of such historical and mythical elements causes Godfrey of Buon to be assembled during the Crusades, because of the meaning of that secret force that had a merely external and contingent manifestation in the political struggle of the Teutonic emperors and in the victory of Ottoi. In the ethics of chivalry and the harsh articulation of the feudal system that was so distant from the social ideal of the primitive church, in the resurrected principle of a warrior caste that had been reintegrated in a way that was both ascetical and sacred, and in the secret ideal of the empire and the crusades, the Christian influence encountered very precise limitations. On the one hand, the church partially accepted these limitations. She allowed herself to be dominated, it became Moroni's, in order to dominate and to remain in control. On the other hand, she resisted by attempting to replace the top of the political hierarchy and to overcome the empire. The rending of the social fabric continued. The forces that were awakened occasionally escaped from the control of the people who had evoked them. When both adversaries disengaged from the mortal duel in which they were locked, they separately underwent a process of decadence. The tension toward the spiritual synthesis weakened. The church increasingly renounced its claim to temporal power and royally its claim to spiritual power. Following the Ghibelin civilization, which we may regard as the splendid spring season of a Europe that was destined to doom, the process of decadence will continue inexorably. Chapter 33 Decline of the Medieval World and the Birth of Nations The decadence of the Holy Roman Empire and, generally speaking, of the principle of true sovereignty was determined by a range of causes from above and below. One of the main causes was the gradual secularization and materialization of the political idea. As far as the empire was concerned, the struggle Frederick to waged against the church, though it was undertaken for the defense of its supernatural character, was associated with an initial upheaval in the following sense. On the one hand, there were a. the incipient humanism, liberalism, and rationalism of the Sicilian court, b. the institution of a body of lay judges and administrative functionaries, and c. the importance given to the law by legislators and by those whom a rightful religious rigorism that reacted to the early products of culture and free thought with autos de fi and executions contemptuously qualified as to algevlossens. On the other hand, there was the centralizing and anti-feudal tendency of some recent imperial institutions. The moment an empire ceases to be sacred, it also ceases to be an empire. The inner vision animating the empire and its authority decline, and once the plane of matter and of mere politics is reached, they totally disappear, since such a plane, by its very nature, excludes every universalism in higher unity. As early as 1338, King Ludwig IV of Bavaria declared that the imperial consecration was no longer necessary and that the elected prince was the legitimate emperor by virtue of this election. Charles IV of Bohemia completed this emancipation with the Golden Bull. Since the consecration, however, was not substituted with something metaphysically comparable, the emperors themselves irrevocably compromised their transcendent dignities. From then on the lost, heaven's mandate and the holy empire survived only nominally. Frederick III of Austria was the last emperor to be crowned in Rome, 1452, after the rite had been reduced to an empty and soulless ceremony. Conversely, it has rightfully been suggested that the feudal system is that which characterizes the majority of the great traditional eras and the one most suited for the regular development of traditional structures. In this type of regime the principle of plurality and of relative political autonomy of the individual parts is emphasized, as is the proper context of that universal element, that unum quad nonis pars that alone can really organize and unify these parts, not by contrasting but by presiding over each one of them through the transcendent, superlytical, and regulating function that the universal embodies, Dante. In this event royalty works together with the feudal aristocracy and the imperial function does not limit the autonomy of the single principalities or kingdoms, as it assumes the single nationalities without altering them. And when, on the other hand, the capability of a fides and a spiritual acknowledgement on the part of the single subordinated elements fails, then what arises is either a centralizing tendency in political absolutism that attempts to hold the whole together through a violent, political, and state-enforced unity rather than through an essentially super-political and spiritual unity, or purely particularistic and disapprocesses. Either way accomplishes the destruction of medieval civilization. 
The kings begin to claim for their own feasts the same principle of absolute authority that is typical of the empire, thus spreading a new and subversive idea, the national state. By virtue of an analogous process, a variety of communes, free cities, republics, and other political entities that have a tendency to establish their independence begin to resist and rebel not only against the imperial authority, but against the nobility too. At this point, the European community begins to fall apart. The principle of a common body of laws declines, even though it leaves enough space for the articulations of a singular os. That is a legislation that corresponds to the same language and a common spirit. Givoli itself begins to decline and with it the ideal of a human type molded by principles of a purely ethical and spiritual nature. Knights begin to defend the rights and to uphold the temporal ambitions of their lords and eventually of the respective national states. The great forces brought together by the superpolitical ideal of holy war or just war are replaced by combinations of both peace and war, which are increasingly brought about by diplomatic shrewdness. Christian Europe high witnesses the fall of the Eastern Empire and of Constantinople at the hands of Ottomans. Moreover, a king of France, Francis I, inflicted the first deadly blow to the myth of Christendom that was the foundation of the European unity when, in his struggle against the representative of the Holy Roman Empire, he did not hesitate to side with the rebellious Protestant princes, and even with the Sultan himself. Clement VII, the only of the King of France, went to war against the Emperor, siding with the Sultan right when the onslaught of Suleiman II in Hungary threatened Europe and when Protestants in arms were about to ravage its heart. Also, a priest in the service of the King of France, Cardinal Richelieu, during the last phase of the Thirty Years' War sided with the Protestant League against the Emperor until, following the Peace of Augsburg, 1555, the Treaties of Westphalia, 1648, swept away the last residue of the religious element, and read the reciprocal tolerance between Protestant and Catholic nations and granted to the rebellious princes an almost total independence from the Empire. From that period on, the supreme interest and the reason for struggle will not even be the ideal defense of a feudal or dynastic privilege, but mere disputes over parts of the European territory. The empire was definitely replaced by imperialisms, that is, by the petty attempts of the national states to assert themselves either militarily or economically over other nations. This upheaval was in primus et anti promoted by the French monarchy in a very specific anti-imperial manner. In the context of these developments, besides the crisis suffered by the imperial idea, the idea of royalty in general became increasingly secularized. The king became merely a warrior and the political leader of his state. He embodied for a little longer a virile function and an absolute principle of authority, yet without any reference to a transcendent reality other than in the empty residual formulation of the divine right as it was defined in Catholic nations after the Council of Trent and during the age of the Counter-Reformation. At that time the Church declared itself ready to sanction and consecrate the absolutism of sovereigns who had lost their sacred inner vocations as long as they were willing to be the secular arm of the Church, which by then had chosen to act indirectly upon European political affairs. For this reason, in the period following the decline of Imperial Europe, we witness in individual states the failure of the ideological premises that justified the struggle with the Church in the name of a higher principle. A more or less external acknowledgement was given to the authority of Rome in matters of religion in return for something useful to the reason of state. Conversely, there were openly declared attempts to subordinate immediately the spiritual to the temporal sphere, as in the Anglican or Gallican upheaval and, later on, in the Protestant world. With the national churches under state control, with the unfolding of the modern era it is possible to witness the establishment of countries as if they were schisms, and the reciprocal opposition not only as political and temporal units but also as almost mystical entities refusing to submit to any superordained authority. One thing becomes very clear. If the empire declines and if it continues to exist only nominally, its antagonist, the church, after enjoying a trammeled freedom from its ancient foe, did not know how to assume its legacy, and demonstrated its inability to organize the western world according to the Guelph ideal. What replaced the empire was not the church at the head of a reinvigorated Christendom, but the multiplicity of national states that were increasingly intolerant of any higher principle of authority. Moreover, the deconsecration of the rulers as well as their insubordination toward the empire, by depriving the organisms over which they presided of the chrism bestowed by a higher principle, unavoidably puts them into the orbit of lower forces that were destined to slowly prevail. Generally speaking, whenever a caste rebels against a higher caste and claims its independence, the higher caste unavoidably loses the character that it had within the hierarchy and thereby reflects the character of the immediately lower caste. 
Absolutism, the materialistic transposition of the traditional idea of unity, paved the way for demagoguing for republican, national, and anti-monarchical revolutions. And in those countries in which the kings, in their struggle against feudal aristocracy and their work of political centralization favored the claims of the bourgeoisie and of the plebs, the process ended even faster. Philip the Fair, who anticipated and exemplified the various stages of the involutive process, is often singled out as an example. With the Pope's complicity, he destroyed the temple order that was the most characteristic expression of the tendency to reconstruct the unity of the priestly and the warrior elements that was the soul of medieval chivalry. He started the process of lay emancipation of the state from the church, which was promoted without interruptions by his successors, just as the struggle against the feudal nobility was carried on, especially by Louis XI and by Louis XIV, without feeling any qualms about using the support of the bourgeoisie and without disavowing the rebellious spirit of lower social strata. Philip the Fair also favored the development of an anti-traditional culture since his legislators were the true foreigners of modern laicism, being much earlier than the Renaissance human. If, on the one hand, it is significant that a priest, Cardinal Richelieu, employed the principle of centralization against the nobility by replacing the feudal structures with the leveling of modern, binomial form, government and nation, on the other hand, Louis XIV, with his formation of public powers and systematic development of national unity taken together with the political, military, and economic strengthening of this very unity prepared the body, so to speak, for the incarnation of a new principle, the people and the nation as a mere collectivity. Thus, the anti-aristocratic action of the kings of France, whose constant opposition to the Holy Empire has been noted, who the Marquis of Mirabeau promoted the logical rebellion against these kings and their expulsion from their contaminated throw. We can argue that since France initiated this upheaval and conferred an increasingly centralizing and nationalist character to the idea of a state, she was the first to witness the demise of the monarchical system and the advent of the republican regime in the sense of a decisive and manifest shift of power to the third estate. Thus, in the whole of European nations, France became the main hotbed of the revolutionary ferment and of the laid rationalistic mentality, which is highly deleterious for any surviving residue of the traditional spirit. There is another specific and interesting complementary aspect of historical nemesis. The emancipation of the empire from the states that had become absolutist was followed by the emancipation of sovereign, free, and autonomous individuals from the state. The former usurpation attracted and presaged the latter. Eventually, in the atomist and anarchical states, as sovereign nations, the usurped sovereignty of the state was destined to be replaced with popular sovereignty, in the context of which every authority and law are legitimate only and exclusively as the expressions of the will of the citizens who are single sovereign individuals. This is the democraticized and liberal state, a prelude to the last phase of this general involution, that is, a purely collectivized society. Beside the causes from above, however, we should not forget the causes from below, which are distinct though parallel to the former ones. Every traditional organization is a dynamic system that presupposes forces of chaos, inferior impulses, and interest as well as lower social and ethnic strata that are dominated and restrained by a principle of form. It also includes the dynamism of the two antagonistic poles. The superior pole, connected to the supernatural element of the higher strata, attempts to lift up the other pole, while the lower pole, which is connected to the mass or demos, attempts to pull down the higher pole. The emergence and liberation, i.e., revolt, of the lower strata are the counterpart of every weakening of the representatives of the higher principle and every deviation or degeneration of the top of the hierarchy. Therefore, because of the previously mentioned processes, the right of demanding of one's subjects the double fides, spiritual and feudal, increasingly degenerated, thus, the way was paved for a materialization of this fides in a political sense and for the aforesaid revolt. In fact, just as faithfulness with a spiritual foundation is unconditional, likewise, that which is connected to the temporal plane is conditioned and contingent and liable to be revoked depending on the empirical circumstances. Also, the dualism of church and state and the persistent opposition of the church to the empire were destined to contribute to lowering every fides to this inferior and precarious level. After all, during the Middle Ages it was the church that blessed the betrayal of the fides by siding with the Italian communes and lending her moral and material support to the revolt against the empire. 
The revolt of the communes, beyond the external aspects, simply represented the insurrection of the particular against the universal in relation to a type of social organization that was no longer he modeled after the warrior caste. But after the third caste, the bourgeoisie and the merchant class, who usurped the dignity of the political government and the right to bear arms, fortified its cities, raised its battle flags, and organized its armies against the imperial cohorts and the defensive alliance of the feudal nobility. Here began the movement from below and the rise of the tide of the inferior forces. While the Italian communes anticipated the profane and anti-traditional ideal of a social organization based on the economic and mercantile factor and the Jewish commerce with gold, their revolt demonstrated how, in some areas, the sensibility that embraced the spiritual and ethical meaning of loyalty and hierarchy was already at that time on the verge of becoming extinct. The emperor came to be perceived as a mere political leader whose political claims could be challenged. This marked the advent of that bad freedom that will destroy and deny every principle of true authority, abandon the inferior forces to themselves, and reduce to a merely human, economic, and social plane any political form, culminating in the omnipotence of the merchants first and of organized labor later. It is significant that the principal hotbed of this cancer was the Italian soil that had previously been the cradle of the Roman world. In the historical struggle of the communes, which were supported by the church against the imperial armies and the Corpus Secularum Principium, we find the last echoes of the struggle between North and South, tradition and anti-tradition. The truth is that Frederick I, a figure whom the plebeian falsification of the Italian patriotic history has repeatedly attempted to discredit, fought in the name of a higher principle and out of a sense of duty, derived from his own function, against a lay and particularistic usurpation that was based, among other things, on unprovoked violations of Pax and Ost. Dante called him the good Barbara Orson and regarded him as the legitimate representative of the empire and the source of any true authority. Moreover, Dante regarded the revolt of the Lombard cities as an illegal and biased struggle due to his noble contempt for the new corners and starts and for the elements of the new and impure power of the communes. Likewise, he saw in the self-government of the individual populations and in the new nationalistic idea a subversive heresy. In reality, the Autos and the Suvians waged their struggle not so much in order to impose a material acknowledgement or because of territorial ambitions, but rather for an ideal reivindication in the defense of a superpolitical right. They demanded obedience not as Teutonic princes, but as Roman, Romorum Regis, yet supernational emperors, they fought against the rebellious race of merchants and burghers in the name of honor and spirit. The latter came to be regarded as rebels, not so much against the emperor, but rather against God, Avir Dio. By divine injunction, Jumini Dio, the prince waged war against them as the representative of Charlemagne, brandishing the avenging sword in order to restore the ancient order, Redder Torres Publicae. Finally, especially in the case of Italy and the so-called Signoris, the counterpart of the successors of the communes, it is possible to detect another aspect of the new climate, of which Machiavelli's prince represented a clear barometric index. During these times, the only person considered fit for government was a powerful individual who would rule not by virtue of a consecration, his nobility, and his representing a higher principle and a tradition, but rather in his own name and by employing cunning, violence, and the means of politics, which by then was regarded as an art, a technique devoid of scruples, honor, and truth with religion having become only an instrument to be employed in its service. Dante correctly said, Italum principum. Qui non heroicum or sed plebo, secundra superabim, thus, the substance of such government was not heroicum plebeian, the ancient virtus descended to this level as did the sense of superiority to both good and evil typically exhibited by those who ruled on the basis of a non-human law. On the one hand, we see the reappearance of the model of ancient tyrannies. On the other hand, we find the expression of that unrestrained individualism that characterizes these new times according to multiple forms. Here we also find the anticipation, in a radical way, of the type of absolute politics and the will to power that in later times will be implemented on a much greater scale. The cycle of the medieval restoration ended with these processes. Somehow we can say that the Ginkarotic, southern ideal triumphed again. In the context of this ideal, the virile principle, apart from the above-mentioned extreme forms, carried only a material, i.e., Political and temporal, meaning even when it was embodied in the person of the monarch. Conversely, the church remained the depository of spirituality in the lunar form of devotional religion and, at most, in the monastic and contemplative orders. After this scission occurred, the privilege of blood in the land or the expressions of a mere will to power became definitely predominant. An unavoidable consequence of this was the particularism of the towns, the homelands, and the various nationalisms. 
What followed was the incipient revolt of the Demos, the collective element that was at the bottom of the traditional social order and that now attempted to take control of the leveled social structures and the unified public powers that were created during the previous anti-feudal phase. The struggle that had most characterized the Middle Ages, that of the heroic virile principle against the church, ended. From now on, Western man would yearn for autonomy and emancipation from the religious bond only in the forms of a deviation, in what could be characterized as a demonic distortion of Gabalinism that was foreshadowed with the taking up of Lutheranism by the German princes. Generally speaking, after the Middle Ages, the West as a civilization became emancipated from the Church and from the Catholic felt and showing only by becoming secularized under the aegis of naturalism and of rationalism, and by extolling as a sign of conquest the impoverishment proper to a perspective and a will that do not recognize anything beyond man and beyond what is conditioned by the human element. One of the commonplace of modern historiography is the polemical exulta of the civilization of the Renaissance over and against medieval civilization. This is not just the expression of a typical misunderstanding, since this mentality is the effect of one among the innumerable deceptions purposely spread in modern culture by the leaders of global subversion. The truth is that after the collapse of the ancient world, if there ever was a civilization that deserves the name of Renaissance, this was the civilization of the Middle Ages. In its objectivity, its virile spirit, its hierarchical structure, its proud anti-humanistic simplicity so often permeated by the sense of the sacred, the Middle Ages represented a return to the origins. I am not looking at the real Middle Ages and at its classical features through rose-colored lenses. The character of the civilization coming after it must be understood otherwise than it has been. During the Middle Ages, the tension that had an essentially metaphysical orientation degenerated and changed polarity. The potential that was previously found in the vertical dimension, upwards, as in the symbol of Gothic cathedrals, flew outward into the horizontal dimension, thus producing phenomena that made an impression on the superficial observer. In the domain of culture this potential produced the tumultuous outburst of multiple forms of a creativity almost entirely deprived of any traditional or even symbolic element, and also, on an external plane. The almost explosive scattering of European populations all over the world during the Age of Discoveries, Explorations, and Colonial Conquest that occurred during the Renaissance and the Age of Humanism. These were the effects of a scattering of forces resembling the scattering of forces that follows the disintegration of an organism. According to some, the Renaissance represented a revival of the ancient classical civilization that allegedly had been rediscovered and reaffirmed against the dark world of medieval Christianity. This is a major blunder. The Renaissance either borrowed decadent forms from the ancient world rather than the forms of the origins permeated by sacred and superpersonal elements, or, totally neglecting such elements, it employed the ancient legacy in a radically new fashion. During the Renaissance, paganism contributed essentially to the development of the simple affirmation of man and to fostering the exulta of the individual, who became intoxicated with the products of an art, erudition, and speculation that lacked any transcendent and metaphysical element. In relation to this, it is necessary to point out the phenomenon of neutralization. Civilization, even as an ideal, ceased to have a unitary axis. The center no longer directed the individual parts, not only in the political, but in the cultural context as well. There no longer was a common organizing force responsible for animating culture. In the spiritual space the empire formerly encompassed unitarily in the ecumenical symbol, there arose by dissociation, that were neutral zones that corresponded to the various branches of the new culture. Art, philosophy, science, and law each developed within their own field of competence, displaying a systematic and flaunted indifference toward anything that could encompass them, free them from their isolation, or give them true principles. Such was the freedom of the new culture. The 17th century, together with the end of the Thirty Years' War and the fundamental overthrow of the Empire, was the age in which this upheaval assumed a radical form, anticipating what is proper to the modern age. Thus ended the medieval impulse to pick up again that torch that ancient Rome had received from the heroic, Olympian Bellas. The tradition of initiatory regality ceased to have contacts with historical reality and with the representatives of any European temporal power, it continued to exist only underground, in secret currents such as Hermeticism and Rosicrucianism, which increasingly withdrew inward as the modern world was taking form, when the organizations that they animated did not themselves undergo a process of involution and inversion. As a myth, medieval civilization left its testament into legends.
According to the first legend, every year on the night of the anniversary of the suppression of the Order of the Knights Templar, an armed shadow wearing a red cross on its white mantle allegedly appears in the crypt of the Templars to inquire who wants to free the Holy Sepulchre. No one is the reply, since the temple has been destroyed. According to the second legend, Frederick I still lives with his knights, although asleep, on the Kefizer Heights inside a symbolic mountain. He awaits the appointed time when he will descend to the valleys below at the head of his faithful in order to fight the last battle, whose successful outcome will cause the dry tree to bloom again and a new age to begin. Chapter 34 Unrealism and Individualism in order to follow the further phases of the decline of the West, it is necessary to refer to what I have previously said about the first crises undergone by traditional civilizations and to assume as a reference point the fundamental truth of the world of tradition concerning the two regions of world and superworld. According to traditional man, these two regions form one reality. The establishment of an objective and efficacious contact between them was the presupposition of any higher form of civilization in life. The interruption of such a contact, the centering of all the possibilities in only one of these worlds, that is, in the human and temporal world, the replacement of the experience of the overworld with ephemeral ghosts and with the byproducts of a merely human nature, these are the characteristics of modern civilization in general. This civilization has reached the stage in which the various forces of decadence, which were manifested in previous times but which had been successfully slowed down either by reactions or by the power of opposite principles, finally reach a complete and fearful officiate. In a general sense, humanism may be regarded as the main trait and password of the new civilization that claims to have emancipated itself from the darkness of the Middle Ages. This civilization will only be limited to the human dimension, in this type of civilization everything will begin and end with man, including the heavens, the hulls, the glorifications, and the curses. The human experience will be confined to this world, which is not the real world, with its feverish and yearning creatures, its artistic vanities and its geniuses, its countless machines, factories, and leaders. The earliest version of humanism was individualism. Individualism should be regarded as the constitution of an illusory center outside the real center, as the prevaricating pretense of a self that is merely a mortal ego endowed with a body, and as by product of purely natural faculties that, with the aid of arts and profane sciences, create and support various appearances with no consistency outside that false and vain center. These truths and laws are marked by the contingency and caducity proper to what belongs to the world of becoming. There is a radical unrealism and inorganic character to all modern phenomena. Nothing is endowed any longer with true life and everything will be a byproduct. The extinct being is replaced in every domain with the will in itself as a sinister, rationalistic, and mechanical propping up of a cadaver. The countless conquests and creations of the new man appear as the crawling of worms that occurs in the process of putrefaction. Thus, the way is opened to all paroxysms, to innovating and iconoclastic manias, and to the world of a fundamental rhetoric in which, once the spirit was replaced with a pale image of itself, the incestuous phonikes of man in the form of religion, philosophy, art, science, and politics, well know no bounds. On a religious plane, unrealism is essentially related to the loss of the initiatic tradition. I have previously pointed out that in the past, only initiation ensured the objective participation of man in the superworld. Following the end of the ancient world and with the advent of Christianity, however, there no longer were the necessary conditions for the initiatoriality to constitute the supreme reference point of a traditional civilization. In this regard, spiritualism was one of the factors that acted in the most negative way, the appearance and the diffusion of the strange idea of the immortality of the soul, which was regarded as the natural privilege of each and every one, eventually contributed to the loss of understanding of the meaning and necessity of initiation as the real operation that alone can free a person from all conditionings and destroy the mortal nature. What arose as a surrogate was the mystery of Christ and the idea of redemption in Christ. In this context, a theme that partially derived from the doctrine of the mysteries, death and resurrection, lost its initiatory character and was eventually applied to the merely religious plane of faith. This surrogate, generally speaking, consisted in a particular morality and in leading a life in view of the sanctions that, according to the new belief, awaited the immortal soul in the afterlife. 
If on the one hand, the imperial medieval idea was often pervaded by the initiatory element, on the other hand, though the representative of the church developed a doctrine of the sacraments, revived the pontifical symbolism, and spoke of regeneration, nevertheless, the idea of initiation as such, which was opposite to its spirit, remained basically alien to it. Thus, an anomaly was created that lacked something in comparison with every other complete traditional form, Islam included. Christian dualism, in its specific character, represented a powerful incentive to subjectivism and therefore to unrealism in regard to the problem of the sacred. The sacred, from a matter of reality and transcendent experience, became either a matter of faith based on sentiment, or the objective theological speculation. The few examples of a purified Christian mysticism could not prevent God and gods, angels and demons, intelligible essences, and their dwellings from assuming the form of myth. The Christianized West ceased to have a knowledge of these things as symbols of potential super-rational experiences, super-individual conditions of existence, and deep dimensions of integral being. The ancient world had witnessed the degeneration of symbolism into a mythology that became increasingly opaque and mute and that eventually became the object of artistic fantasy. When the experience of the sacred was reduced to faith, sentiment, and moralism, and when the intuitive intellectualist was reduced to a mere concept of scholastic philosophy, the unrealism of the spirit entirely took over the domain of the supernatural. This course underwent a further development with Protestantism, the contemporaneity of which with humanism and with the Renaissance is significant. Rescinding from his final meeting in the history of civilization, its antagonistic role during the Middle Ages, and its lack of an initiatic and esoteric dimension, we nevertheless must acknowledge a certain traditional character to the Church that lifted it above what had been mere Christianity because it established a system of dogmas, symbols, myths, rituals, and sacred institutions in which, though often indirectly, elements of a superior knowledge were sometimes preserved. By rigidly upholding the principle of authority and dogma, by defending the transcendent and superrational character of revelation in the domain of knowledge and the principle of the transcendence of grace in the domain of action, the Church defended from any heresy, almost desperately, the non-human character of his deposit. This extreme effort of Catholicism, which explains much of whatever is crude and violent in its history, however, encountered a limit. The dam could not hold in some forms that could be justified in a merely religious context could. That retain the character of absoluteness that is proper to what is non-human. This was especially true not only because a superior knowledge was lacking, but also considering that the secularization of the church, the corruption, and the unworthiness of a great number of its representatives and the increasing importance that political and contingent interest acquired within it became increasingly visible. Thus, this stage was set for a reaction destined to inflict a serious blow to the traditional element that was added to Christianity to exasperate the unrealist subjectivism and to uphold an individualism in a religious context, for this is what the Reformation accomplished. It is hot a coincidence that Luther's invective against the papacy, the devil's creature in Rome, and against Rome as the kingdom of Babylon, and as a radically pagan reality totally inimical to the Christian spirit were very similar to those invectives employed by the early Christians and by the Jewish apocalyptic text against the city of the eagle and of the battle axe. By rejecting everything in Catholicism that was tradition and opposed to the simple Gospels, Luther demonstrated a fundamental misunderstanding of that superior content that cannot be reduced either to the Jewish southern substratum, or to the world of mere devotion, which in the Church had developed through secret influences from above. The Ghibelline emperors rose up against Papal Rome in the name of Rome, thus upholding again the superior idea of the setting P against both the merely religious spirituality of the Church and her hegemonic claims. Instead, Luther rose up against Papal Rome out of an intense dislike for what was a positive aspect, that is, the traditional hierarchical and ritual component that existed within the Catholic Compromise. In many regards, Luther facilitated a mutilating emancipation, even in the domain of politics. By supporting the Reformation, the Germanic princes, instead of assuming the legacy of Frederick II, went over to the anti-imperial coalition. And the author of The Warning in St. Liebendetchen, who presented himself as the prophet of the German people, these princes saw one who led their revolt against the imperial principle of authority with his doctrines and who allowed them to disguise their insubordination in the form of an anti-Roman crusade waged in the name of the gospel, according to which they had no other goal than to be free German rulers and to be emancipated from any supernational hierarchical bond.
Luther also contributed to an involutive process in another way. His doctrine subordinated religion to the state in all of its concrete manifestations. Because the government of the states was the responsibility of mere secular rulers, because Luther foreshadowed a democratic theme that was later on perfected by Calvin, the rulers do not govern by virtue of their nature, but because they are the representatives of the community. Because a characteristic of the Reformation was the radical negation of the Olympian or heroic ideal, or any possibility on man's part to go beyond his limitations either through asceticism or consecration, and in so to be qualified to exercise even the right from above, which is typical of true leaders, because of all these reasons, Luther's views concerning secular authority, die Welt Schilberkeit, practically amounted to an inversion of the traditional doctrine concerning the regal primacy and thus left the doors open for the usurpation of spiritual authority on the part of the temporal power. When defining the theme of the Leviathan, or of the absolute state, Habi similarly proclaimed, to wait in tamiti kolesamide mariemes. From the point of view of the metaphysics of history, the positive and objective contribution of Protestantism consists, since having emphasized that in mankind living in recent times a truly spiritual principle was no longer immediately present and that, therefore, mankind had to portray this principle as something transcendent. On this basis, Catholicism itself had already assumed the myth of original sin. Protestantism exasperated this myth by proclaiming the fundamental powerlessness of man to achieve salvation through his own efforts. Generally speaking, they regarded the whole of humankind as a damned mass, condemned to automatically commit evil. To the truth of slightly foreshadowed by that myth, Protestantism added tints typical of an authentic Syrian masochism that were expressed in rather revolting images. Over and against the ancient ideal of spiritual virility, Luther did not hesitate to call a royal waiting one in which the soul, portrayed as a prostitute and as the most wretched and sinful creature, plays the role of the woman, see Luther's De Libri Christiana, and to compare man to a beast of burden on which either God or the devil ride at will, without his being able to do anything about it, see Luther's De Servo Arbitro. While what should have followed from the acknowledgement of the above-mentioned existential situation was the affirmation of the need for the support proper to a ritual and hierarchical system, or the affirmation of the strictest type of asceticism, Luther denied both things. The entire system of Luther's thought was visibly conditioned by his personal equation and the gloomy character of his inner life as a failed monk and a man who was unable to overcome his own nature, influenced as it was by his passions, sensuality, and anger. This personal equation was reflected in the peculiar doctrine according to which the Ten Commandments had not been given by God to men to be implemented in this life but so that man, after acknowledging his inability to fulfill them, his nothingness, as well as concupiscence invincibility and his inner tendency to sin, would entrust himself to a personal God and trust desperately in his free grace. This justification by faith alone and the ensuing condemnation of the power of works led Luther to attack the monastic life and the ascetical life, which he called vain and hopeless, thus deterring Western man from pursuing those residual possibilities of reintegration available in the contemplative life that Catholicism had preserved and that had produced figures like Bernard of Clairvaux, Dean Van Riesbrook, Bonaventure, and Meister Eckhart. Secondly, the Reformation denied the principle of authority and hierarchy in the dimension of the sacred. The idea that a human being, as a pontex, could be infallible in matters of sacred doctrine and also legitimately claim the right to an authority beyond criticism was regarded as aberrant and absurd. According to the Reformers, Christ did not give to any church, not even to a Protestant church, the privilege of infallibility. Thus, anybody is able to reach conclusions in matters of doctrine and interpretation of the sacred text through a free and individual examination outside any control and any tradition not only was the distinction between lady and priesthood in the field of knowledge basically abolished but also denied was the priestly dignity understood not as an empty attribute but in reference to those who unlike other people are endowed with a supernatural chrism and who carry an indulgence indelibilis that allows them to activate the rites these being residues of the ancient notion of the lord of the rites for therefore the objective non human meaning that not only the dogma and the symbols but the system of rites and the sacraments could have as well was denied and rejected one might object that all this no longer existed in Catholicism or that it existed only formally and directly. But in that case, the way leading to an authentic reformation should have been one and one alone, to act in earnest and replace the unworthy representatives of the spiritual principle and tradition with worthy ones. Instead, Protestantism has led to a destruction and a denial that were not balanced with any true constructive principle.
but rather only with an illusion, namely, sheer faith. According to Protestantism, salvation consisted in the mere subjective assurance of being counted in the ranks of those who have been saved by faith in Christ, and chosen by divine grace. In this fashion, mankind progressed along the path of spiritual unrealism. The materialistic repercussion did not delay its appearance. After rejecting the objective notion of spirituality as a reality ranking higher than profane existence, the Protestant doctrine allowed man to feel, in all aspects of life, as a being who was simultaneously spiritual and earthly, justified and sinner. In the end, this led to a radical secularization of all higher vocations, again, not to sacralization, but to moralism and puritanism. It was in the historical development of Protestantism, especially in Anglo-Saxon Calvinism and Puritanism, that the religious idea became increasingly dissociated from any transcendent interests and thus susceptible to being used to sanctify any temporal achievement to the point of generating a kind of mysticism of social service, work, progress, and even profit. These forms of Anglo-Saxon Protestantism were characterized by communities of believers with no leader to represent a transcendent principle of authority. Thus, the ideal of the state was reduced to that of the mere society of free Christian citizens. In this type of society, profit became the sign of divine election that, once the prevalent criterion became the economic one, corresponds to wealth and to prosperity. In this we can clearly distinguish one of the aspects of the above-mentioned degrading regression. This Calvinist theory was really the materialistic and lay counterfeit of the ancient mystical doctrine of victory. For quite a long time this theory has supplied an ethical and religious justification for the rise to power of the merchant class and of the third estate during the cycle of the modern democracies and capitalism. The individualism intrinsic in the Protestant theory of private interpretation of scripture is connected with another aspect of modern humanism, rationalism. The single individual who got rid of the dogmatic tradition and the principle of spiritual authority by claiming to have within himself the capability of right discernment gradually ended up promoting the cult of that which in him, as a human being, is the basis of all judgments, namely, the faculty of reason, thus turning it into the criterion of all certitudes, truths, and norms. This is precisely what happened in the West shortly after the Reformation. Naturally, there were some germs of rationalism in ancient Hellas, exemplified in the Socratic replacement of the concept of reality with reality itself, and in the Middle Ages, in the theology that was heavily influenced by philosophy. Beginning with the Renaissance, however, rationalism became differentiated and assumed. In one of its most important currents, a new character, from speculative in nature it became aggressive and generated the Enlightenment, encyclopedism, and anti-religious and revolutionary criticism. In this regard, it is necessary to acknowledge the effects of further processes of involution and inversion that display an even more sinister character because they negatively affected some surviving organizations of an enchatic type, as in the case of the Illuminati and of modern masonry. The superiority over dogma and over the merely religious Western forms, a superiority granted to the initiate by the process of spiritual enlightenment, was claimed by those who upheld the sovereign power of reason. Members of such organizations promoted this inversion until they transformed the groups that they led into active instruments of the diffusion of anti-traditional and rationalist thought. One of the most tangible examples of this is the role masonry played in the American Revolution as well as in the underground ideological preparation of the French Revolution and in the revolutions that occurred in Spain, Turkey, and Italy, among others. This is how the secret front of world subversion and counter-tradition was formed not just through general influences alone, but also through specific centers of action. In yet another one of its fifth columns, which was limited to the domain of speculative thought, rationalism was destined to develop along unrealist lines and to generate absolutism and panlogism. The identity of spirit and thought, of concept and reality was upheld. Logical hypostasis such as the transcendental ego replaced the real ego as well as any premonition of the true supernatural principle within man. The so-called critical thought that has reached consciousness of itself declared, everything that is real is rational and everything that is rational is real, which truly represents the extreme form of unrealism. Rather than in similar philosophical abstractions, Rationalism played a much more important role in a practical way in the construction of the modern world by joining forces with empiricism and experimentalism in the context of scientism. Again, 
The birth of modern naturalistic and scientific thought coincided with the Renaissance and the Reformation, since these phenomena were the expressions of the same one global upheaval. Individualism is necessarily associated with naturalism. With the revolt of individualism, all consciousness of the superworld was lost. The only thing that was still regarded as all-inclusive and certain was the material view of the world, or nature seen as exteriority and a collection of phenomena. A new way to look at the world had emerged. In the past there had been anticipations of this upheaval, but they remained sporadic apparitions that were never transformed into forces responsible for shaping civilizations. It was at this time that reality became synonymous with materiality. The new ideal of science was concerned exclusively with the physical dimension and was eventually confined to a construction. This ideal no longer represented the synthesis of an intellectual intuition, but rather the effort of purely human faculties to unify the multiple varieties of impressions and sensible apparitions from the outside inductively, with the sense of touch rather than of sight. The conquest of science merely consisted in the discovery of mathematical relations, laws of consistency and uniform succession, hypotheses, and abstract principles the value of which was exclusively determined by the capability of predicting, more or less exactly, the eventual outcome, yet without providing any essential knowledge and without revealing meanings capable of leading to an inner liberation and elevation. This did knowledge of dead objects lead to the sinister art of producing artificial, automatic, and obstacle demonic entities. The advent of rationalism and scientism was unavoidably followed by the advent of technology and machines, which have become the center and the apotheosis of the new human world. Moreover, modern science is responsible for the systematic profanation of the two domains of action and contemplation, and also for the plebs' rise to power in the European nations. It was science that degraded and democratized the very notion of knowledge by establishing the uniform criterion of truth and certainty based on the soulless world of numbers and the superstition represented by the positivist method, which is indifferent toward everything that presents a qualitative and symbolic character in empirical data. It was science that precluded any appreciation of the traditional disciplines. Through the mirage of evident phenomena that are accessible to everyone, science has upheld the superiority of lay culture by creating the myth of the scholar and of the scientist. It was science that, by dispelling the darkness of superstition and of religion, and by insinuating the image of natural necessity, has progressively and objectively destroyed any possibility of a subtle relationship with the secret powers of things. It was science that snatched away from man the voice of the sea, the earth, and the heavens and created the myth of the new age of progress, opening doors for everybody and fomenting the great rebellion of the slaves. It is science that today, by providing the instruments for the control and employment of every force of nature according to the ideals of a demonic conquest, has engendered the most formidable temptation ever to confront man, that he may mistake his renunciation as an act of real power and something to be proud of and mistake a shadow of power for the real thing. This process of detachment, of loss of the superworld and tradition, of all-powerful laicism and triumphant rationalism and naturalism is identical both on the plane of the relationship between man and reality and on the plane of society, the state, and morality. When dealing with the issue of the death of civilizations, I have mentioned that the inner adherence of humble and ignorant people to leaders and traditional institutions was justified in that it represented a way leading to a fruitful hierarchical relationship with beings who knew and who were and who kept alive a non-human spirituality of which any traditional law was the embodiment and the adaptation. But when such a reference point is no longer present, or when it is present only in a symbolic way, then subordination is vain and obedience is sterile. The final outcome is a petrification and not a ritual participation. And so, in the modern and humanized world that lacks the dimension of transcendence, any law of the hierarchical order and stability was bound to disappear, especially on the outer plane, until the achievement of the state of radical atomization of the single individual, not only in matters of religion, but also in the political domain through the denial of any traditional value, institution, and authority. Once the fines was secularized, the revolt against spiritual authority was followed by the revolt against temporal power and by the revendication of human rights, by the affirmation of freedom and the equality of all human beings, by the definitive abolition of the idea of caste, which came to be understood in socio-economic terms as functional class and of privilege, and by a disintegration of the traditional social structures promoted by Libida. But the law of action-reaction determines a collectivist upheaval to follow automatically every individualistic usurpation, 
the Cassilis, the emancipated slave, and the glorified pariah, the modern free man, has against himself the mass of the other Cassilis and, in the end, the brute power of the collectivity. Thus, the process of disintegration continues and what ensues is a regression from the personal to the anonymous, the herd, and the pure, chaotic, and inorganic realm of quantity. Just as the scientific enterprise is sought, from the outside, to recreate the multiplicity of particular phenomena, while having lost that inner and true unity that exists only in the context of metaphysical knowledge, so have moderns tried to replace the unity that in ancient societies consisted of living traditions and sacred law with an exterior anodyne, and mechanical unity in which individuals are brought together without an organic relation to each other, and without seeing any superior principle or figure, the obeying of which would mean consent, and submission to which would represent an acknowledgement and elevation. In this way, new collective forms arise that are essentially based on the conditions of material existence and on the various factors of a merely social life, which in turn is dominated by the impersonal and leveling system of public powers. These collective forms soon overthrow individualism, and whether they present themselves in the guise of democracies or national states, republics or dictatorships, they begin to be carried along by independent subhuman forces. The most decisive episode in the unleashing of the European plebs, the French Revolution, already displays the typical traits of this overthrow. When studying the French Revolution, it is possible to see how these forces soon escape from the control of those who have evoked them. Once the revolution was unleashed, it seems as if it assumed a life of its own, leading men, rather than the other way around. It eventually devoured its own children one by one. Its leaders, rather than real personalities, appear to be the embodiment of the revolutionary spirit and to be carried along as inane and automatic objects. They ride the wave, so to speak, as long as they follow the current and are useful to the goals set by the revolution. But as soon as they try to dominate it or to stop it, the maelstrom submerges them. Some specific traits of the French Revolution include the speed and the power with which it spread and the speed with which events followed one another and obstacles in its way were overcome. In these traits what is visible is the emergence of an unhuman element and a subpersonal reality that has a mind and a life of its own and that employs men as mere tools. This very same phenomenon may be observed, though in different degrees and forms, in some salient aspects of modern society in general, especially after the collapse of the last dams, politically, the anonymous character of the structures that credit the people and the nation with the origin of all powers is interrupted only to generate phenomena that resemble totally the ancient popular tyrannies. That is, personalities that enjoy a brief popularity by virtue of their being masters and awakening the irrational forces of the demos and in directing their course, all the while lacking an authentically superior principle and thus having only an illusory dominion over what they have awakened. The acceleration that characterizes all fallen bodies causes a phase of individualism and rationalism to be overcome and to be followed by the emergence of irrational and elemental forces characterized by mystical overtones. It is here that we encounter further developments in the well-known process of regression. In the domain of culture, this regression is accompanied by an upheaval that has been characterized with the expression treason of the clerics. The people who still reacted against the materialism of the masses by adhering to disinterested forms of activity and to superior values, and who, by opposing their own faithfulness to high interest and principles to the masses' passion and irrational life, represented the vestiges of transcendence that at least prevented the inferior elements from turning their ambitions and their way of life into the only religion. These very same people in recent times have extolled that plebeian realism and that deconsecre in inferior existence, and have conferred upon it the aura of a mysticism, a morality, and a religion. Not only did they begin to cultivate realistic passions, particularisms, and political rivalries, not only did they begin frantically to pursue temporal achievements and conquest right at the time their moderating and contrasting role was needed the most to stem the surging power of the inferior element, but, worse yet, they began to celebrate the only human possibilities that are worthy and fit to be cultivated, and the only ones from which man can draw the fullness of the moral and spiritual life. Thus, these people who supplied the passions and the instincts of the masses with powerful doctrinal, philosophical, and even religious justifications with the result of strengthening their power and at the same time covering with ridicule and contempt any transcendent interest or principle that is truly over and above the particularisms of race or nation and free of all human, socio-political conditionings. In this we can recognize again the phenomena of a pathological inversion of polarity. The human person in his superior faculties becomes the instrument of other forces that replace him and that often use him to bring about spiritual havoc without him even realizing it.
After all, when the intellectual faculties were applied in a systematic and concerted way to the naturalistic inquiry, this represented a treason. The profane science that derived from this type of inquiry portrayed itself as the true science, it sided with rationalism in the attack against tradition and religion, and it put itself in the service of the material needs of life, the economy, industry, production and overproduction, and the lust for power and riches. The law and morals became secularized along the same lines. They no longer were, from above and oriented downwards. They lost every spiritual justification and purpose and they acquired a merely social and human meaning. It is significant that in some of the more recent ideologies they have claimed the same ancient authority, though with an inverted direction, from below and upwards. I am referring to the morality that recognizes a value in the individual only in so much as he is a member of a collective, a cephalous entity that identifies his destiny and happiness with the latter's and denounces as decadence and as alienation any form of activity that is not socially relevant and in the service of the organized plebs that are on their way to conquering the planet. I will return to these considerations when discussing the specific forms with which the present cycle is about to end. At this point, I will only mention the definitive overthrow of individualism that originated the process of disintegration, an individualism that no longer exists other than in the residues and the validity of a pale and powerless humanism typical of bourgeois literates, with the principle according to which man, rather than as an individual, must be made to feel part of a group, faction, party, or cultivity, and have a value only in relationship with these units, we find the reproduction of the relationship that primitive and savage man had toward the totem of his tribe, and of the worst type of fetishism. In general, modern man has looked at the shift from a civilization of being to a civilization of becoming as a real step forward. The valorization of the purely temporal aspect of reality in the name of history, hence historicism, has been one of the consequences of the shift. Once contact with the origins was lost the indefinite, senseless, and accelerated motion of what has rightly been called an escape forward in the name of evolution and progress has become the main feature of modern civilization. Quite frankly, the germs of this superstitious mythology applied to time may be found in Judeo-Christian eschatology and messianism as well as in early Catholic apologetics, which valorize the novelty of the Christian revelation so much so that in Ambrose's polemics against the Roman tradition we can find an early formulation of the theory of progress. The rediscovery of man promoted by the Renaissance represented a fertile habitat for the growth of those germs, up to the period of the Enlightenment and scientism. Ever since then the impressive development of the sciences of nature and technology, as well as of inventions, has acted like opium, distracting man's mind and preventing him from perceiving the underlying and essential meaning of the entire movement, the abandonment of being and dissolution of any centrality in man, and his identification with the current of becoming, which has become stronger than him. And when the fantastic ideas of the cautious kind of progressivism are at risk of being unmatched, the new religions of life and the elan vital, as well as Faustian activity and myth, make their appearance and become new intellectual drugs that ensure that the movement may not be interrupted but spurred on, so that it may acquire a meaning in itself, both for man and for existence in general. Again, the overthrow of the civilization of being is very evident. The center has shifted toward that evasive elemental power of the inferior region that in the world of tradition had always been considered an inimical force. In this world, the task of anybody who yearned for a higher existence, as foreshadowed in the heroic and Olympian myth, consisted in subduing that force and in subjecting it to a form, a dominion, and an enlightenment of the soul. The human energies that were traditionally oriented in the direction of disidentification and of liberation, or which, at the very least, recognized the supreme dignity in this approach, so much so as to establish the system of hierarchical participations, after a sudden polar shift, have entered into the service of the forces of becoming by upholding, helping, exciting, and accelerating the rhythm of these forces in the modern world. On this basis, what we find in modern activity, instead of a path toward the superindividual, as in the case of the ancient possibilities of heroic asceticism, is a path to the subindividual, destructive incursions of the irrational and of the collective element into the already shaking structures of human personality are thus promoted and furthered. More in some sectors is there a lack of a certain, frantic element analogous to that of ancient Dionysism, though on a lower and darker plane, since every reference to the sacred is absent and since the human circuits are the only ones to welcome and to absorb the evoked forces. 
The spiritual overcoming of time, achieved by rising up to the experience of what is eternal, is today replaced with its counterfeit, namely, the mechanical and illusory overcoming of time produced by the speed, immediacy, and simultaneity live, the media would say, employed in modern technology. Those who see the part of themselves that is not contingent upon time are able to comprehend it with one glance as it presents itself the stream of becoming. Just as one, who by climbing to the top of a tower, is able to gain an overall view and understand the unity of individual things that could otherwise only be perceived had they been experienced successively. Conversely, those who, with an opposite movement, immerse themselves in becoming and delude themselves about being able to possess it will only know the excitement, the vertigo, the convulsive acceleration of speed, and the excesses resulting from sensation and agitation. This precipitation of those who identify themselves with becoming, who pick up speed, disrupt duration, destroy intervals, and abolish distances eventually flows into immediacy and thus into a real disintegration of inner unity. Being in stability are regarded by our contemporaries as akin to death. They cannot live unless they act, fret, or distract themselves with this or that. Their spirit, provided we can still talk about a spirit in their case, feeds only on sensations and on dynamism, thus becoming the vehicle for the incarnation of arca forces. Thus, the modern myths of action appear to be the foreigners of a last and decisive phase, after the disembodied and sidereal certainties of the superworld have faded into the distance like mountain peaks on a cloudy day, beyond the rationalist constructions and the technological devastations, beyond the impure fires of the collective vital substance, and beyond the fogs and the mirages of modern culture, a new era appears to be coming in which Luciferian and theophobic individualism will be definitively overcome and new unrestrainable powers will drag along in their wake this world of machines and these intoxicated and spent beings, who in the course of their downfall have erected titanic temples for them and have opened the ways of the earth. It is significant that the modern world shows a return of the themes that were proper to the ancient southern Yinkrotic civilizations. Is it not true that socialism and communism are materialized in technological revivals of the ancient Telluric, southern principle of equality and promiscuity of all beings in Mother Earth? In the modern world the predominant ideal of virility has been reduced to merely the physical and phallic components, just like in the Aphrodistic Gynocarchus. The plebeian feeling of the motherland that triumphed with the French Revolution and was developed by nationalistic ideologies as the mysticism of the common folk and the sacred and omnipotent motherland is nothing less than the revival of a form of feminine totemism. In the democratic regimes, the fact that kings and the heads of state lack any real autonomy bears witness to the loss of the absolute principle of fatherly sovereignty and the return of those who have in the mother, that is, in the substance of the demos, the source of their being. The terrorism and Amazonism today are also present in new forms, such as the disintegration of the family, modern sensuality, and the incessant and turbid quest for women and immediate sexual gratification, as well as in the masculination of the woman, her emancipation, and her standing above men who have become enslaved to their senses or turned into beasts of burden. Concerning Dionysus Mass, I have previously identified it with ceaseless activity and with the philosophy of becoming. And so today we witness a revival, monotus matinus, of the same civilization of decadence that appeared in the ancient Mediterranean world, though in its lowest forms. What is lacking, in fact, is a sense of the sacred, as well as any equivalent of the chaste and calm Demetrian possibility. Rather than the survival of the positive religion that became prominent in the West, today the symptoms are rather the dark advocate proper to the various mediumistic, spiritualistic, and ethusophical currents that emphasize the subconscious, and are characterized by a pantheistic and materialistic mysticism, these currents proliferate and grow in a way that is almost epidemic wherever, for example, in Anglo-Saxon countries, the materialization of the virile type in ordinary existence has reached its peak and wherever Protestantism has secularized and impoverished the religious ideal. Thus, the parallel is almost complete and the cycle is about to close. Chapter 35, The Regression of the Cast As my intent was to offer a bird's eye view of history, in the previous pages I have presented all the elements necessary to formulate an objective law at work in the various stages of the process of decadence, that is, the law of the regression of the caste. A progressive shift of power and type of civilization has occurred from one caste to the next since prehistoric times, from sacred leaders, to a warrior aristocracy, to the merchants, and finally, to the serfs. 
These castes in traditional civilizations corresponded to the qualitative differentiation of the main human possibilities. In the face of this general movement, anything concerning the various conflicts among peoples, the life of nations, or other historical accidents plays only a secondary and contingent role. I have already discussed the dawn of the age of the first caste. In the West, the representatives of the divine royalty and the leaders who embody the two powers, spiritual and temporal, in what I have called spiritual virility and Olympian sovereignty, belong to a very distant and almost mythical past. We have seen how, through the gradual deterioration of the light of the North, the process of decadence has unfolded. In the Ghibelin ideal of the Holy Roman Empire I have identified the last echo of the highest tradition. Once the apex disappeared, authority descended to the level immediately below, that is, to the caste of the warriors. The stage was then set for monarchs who were mere military leaders, lords of temporal justice and, in more recent times, politically absolute sovereigns. In other words, regality of blood replaced regality of the spirit. In a few instances it is still possible to find the idea of divine right, but only as a formula lacking a real content. We find such rulers in antiquity behind institutions that retained the traits of the ancient sacred regime only in a formal way. In any event in the West, with the dissolution of the medieval humanity, the passage into the second phase became all-encompassing and definitive. During this stage, the tide cementing the state no longer had a religious character, but only a warrior one. It meant loyalty, faithfulness, honor. This was essentially the age and the cycle of the great European monarchies. Then a second collapse occurred as the aristocracies began to fall into decay and the monarchies to shake at the foundations. Through revolutions in constitutions, they became useless institutions subject to the will of the nation, and sometimes they were even ousted by different regimes. The principle characterizing this state of affairs was, the king reigns but he does not rule. Together with parliamentary republics, the formation of the capitalist oligarchs revealed the shift of power from the second caste, the warrior, to the modern equivalent of the third caste, the mercantile class. The kings of the coal, oil, and iron industries replaced the previous kings of blood and of spirit. Antiquity, too, sometimes knew this phenomenon in sporadic forms. In Roman and Greece, the aristocracy of wealth repeatedly forced the hand of the hierarchical structure by pursuing aristocratic positions, undermining sacred laws in traditional institutions and infiltrating the militia, priesthood, or consulship. In later times what occurred was the rebellion of the communes and the rise of the various medieval formations of mercantile power. The solemn proclamation of the rights of the Third Estate in France represented the decisive stage, followed by the varieties of bourgeois revolution of the third caste, which employed liberal and democratic ideologies for its own purposes. Correspondingly, this era was characterized by the theory of the social contract. At this time, the social bond was no longer a finds of a warrior type based on relationships of faithfulness and honor. Instead, it took on a utilitarian and economic character. It consisted of an agreement based on personal convenience and non-material interests that only a merchant could have conceived. Gold became a means and a powerful tool. Those who knew how to acquire it and to multiply it, capitalism, high finance, industrial trust, behind the appearances of democracy, virtually controlled political power and the instruments employed in the art of opinion making. Aristocracy gave way to plutocracy, the warrior, to the banker and industrialists. The economy triumphed on all fronts. Trafficking with money and charging interest, activities previously confined to the ghettos, invaded the new civilization. According to the expression of W. Sombart, in the promised land of Protestant Puritanism, Americanism, Capitalism, and the distilled Jewish spirit coexist. It is natural that given these congenial premises, the modern representatives of secularized Judaism saw the ways to achieve world domination open up before them. In this regard, Karl Marx wrote, one of the mundane principles of Judaism, practical necessity and the pursuit of one's own advantage, what is it through God, money? The Jew has emancipated himself in a typically Jewish fashion not only in that he has taken control of the power of money, but also in that through him, money has become a world power and the practical Jewish spirit has become the spirit of the Christian people. The Jews have emancipated themselves insofar as the Christians have become Jews. The God of the Jews has become secularized and has become the God of the earth. The exchange is the true God of the Jews.
In reality, the codification of the traffic with gold as a loan charge with interest, to which the Jews had been previously devoted since they had no other means through which they could affirm themselves, may be said to be the very foundation of the acceptance of the aberrant development of all that is banking, high finance, and pure economy, which are spreading like a cancer in the modern world. This is the fundamental time in the age of the merchants. Finally, the crisis of bourgeois society, class struggle, the proletarian revolt against capitalism, the manifesto promulgated at the Third International, or Comintern, in 1919, and the correlative organization of the groups and the masses in the cadres proper to a socialist civilization of labor, all these bear witness to the Third Collapse, in which power tends to pass into the hands of the lowest of the traditional castes, the caste of the beasts of burden and the standardized individuals. The result of this transfer of power was a reduction of horizon and value to the plane of matter, the machine, and the reign of quantity. The prelude to this was the Russian Revolution. Thus, the new ideal became the proletarian ideal of a universal and communist civilization. We may compare the above-mentioned phenomena of the awakening and gushing forth of elemental subhuman forces within the structures of the modern world to a person who can no longer endure the tension of the spirit first cast, and eventually not even the tension of the will as a free force that animates the body or a cast, and who thus gives into the subpersonal forces of the organic system and all of a sudden reacts almost magnetically under the impulse of another life that replaces his own. The ideas and the passions of the Demma soon escape in's control and they begin to act as if they had acquired an autonomous and dreadful life of their own. These passions pit nations and collectivities against each other and result in unprecedented conflicts and crises. At the end of the process, once the total collapse has occurred, there awaits an international system under the brutal symbols of the hammer and the sickle. Such are the horizons facing the contemporary world. Just as it is only by adhering to free activity that man can truly be free and realize his own self, likewise, by focusing on practical and utilitarian goals, economic achievements, and whatever was once the exclusive domain of the inferior caste man abdicates, disintegrates, loses his center, and opens himself up to infernal forces of which he is destined to become the unwilling and unconscious instrument. Moreover, contemporary society looks like an organism that has shifted from a human to a subhuman type in which every activity and reaction is determined by the needs and the dictates of purely physical life. Man's dominating principles are those typical of the material part of traditional hierarchies, golden work. This is how things are today. These two elements, almost without exception, affect every possibility of existence and give shape to the ideologies and myths that clearly testify to the gravity of the modern perversion of all values. Not only does the quadrupoda regression have a socio-political scope, but it also invests every domain of civilization. In architecture, the regression is symbolized by the shift from the temple first caste as the dominant building, to the fortress and castle caste of the warriors, to the city-state surrounded by protecting walls, age of the merchants, to the factory, and finally to the rational and dull buildings that are the hives of mass man. The family, which in the origins had a sacred foundation, shifted to an authoritarian model, Hytrike potestas in a mere juridical sense, then to a bourgeois and conventional one, until it will finally dissolve when the party, the people, and society will supersede it in importance and dignity. The notion of war underwent analogous phases. From the doctrine of the sacred war and of the Moors Trompolis a shift occurred to war waged in the name of the right and of the honor of one's lord, war recast. In the third stage conflicts are brought about by national ambitions that are contingent upon the plans and the interests of a supremacist economy and industry cast of the merchants. Finally, there arose the communist theory according to which war among nations is just a bourgeois residue, since the only just war is the world revolution of the proletarian class waged against the capitalist in the so-called imperialist world, caste of the serfs. In the aesthetics I mentioned, a shift occurred from a symbolic, sacred art closely related to the possibilities of predicting future events in magic, first caste, to the predominance of epic art and poems, caste of the warriors. This was followed by a shift to romantic, conventional, sentimentalist, erotic, and psychological art that is produced for the consumption of the bourgeois class, until finally, new social or socially involved views of art begin to emerge that advocate an art for the use and consumption of the masses. The traditional world and the super-individual unity characterizing the orders. In the West first came ascetic, monastic orders, these were followed by knightly orders, castes of the warriors, which in turn were followed by the unity sworn to in Masonic lodges, which worked hard to prepare the revolution of the third estate and the advent of democracy. 
Finally came the network of revolutionary and activist cadres of the communist international blast cast and bent on the destruction of the previous socio-political order. It is on the plane of ethics that the process of degradation is particularly visible. While the first age was characterized by the ideal of spiritual virility, initiation, and an ethics aimed at overcoming all human bonds, and while the Age of the Warriors was characterized by the ideal of heroism, victory, and lordship, as well as by the aristocratic ethics of honor, faithfulness, and chivalry, during the Age of the Merchants the predominant ideals were of pure economics, profit, prosperity, and of science as an instrument of a technical and industrial progress that propels production and new profits in a consumer society. Finally, the advent of the serfs corresponds to the elevation of the slave's principle, work, to the status of a religion. It is the hatred harbored by the slave that sadistically proclaims, If anyone will not work, neither let him eat. 2 Thessalonians 3.10 The slave's self-congratulating stupidity creates sacred incenses with the exile of human sweat, hence expressions such as work a noble's man, the religion of work, and work as a social and ethical duty. We have previously learned that the ancient world despised work only because it knew action. The opposition of action to work is an opposition between the spiritual, pure, and free pole, and the material, impure pole impregnated only with human possibilities, was at the basis of that contempt. The loss of the sense of this opposition, and the animal-like subordination of the former to the latter, characterizes the last ages. And where in ancient times every work, through an inner transfigurate owing to its purity and its meaning as an offering oriented upwards, could redeem itself until it became a symbol of action, now, following an upheaval in the opposite direction, which can be observed during the age of the serfs, every residue of action tends to be degraded to the form of work. The degeneration of the ancient aristocratic and sacred ethics into the modern plebeian and materialistic morality is expressively characterized by such a shift from the plane of action to the plane of work. Superior men who lived in a not-so-distant past either acted or directed actions. Modern man works. The only real difference today is that which exists between the various kinds of work. There are intellectual workers and those who use their limbs and machines. In any event, the notion of action is dying out in the modern world, together with that of absolute personality. Moreover, among all the commissioned arts, antiquity regarded as most disgraceful those devoted to the pursuit of pleasure, minimi quaeritis is probine die, crime in distrisum volopatum, this, after all, is precisely the kind of work respected the most in this day and age. Beginning with the scientist, technician, and politician, and with the rationalized system of productive organization, work supposedly leads to the realization of an ideal more fitting for a human animal an easier life that is more enjoyable and safer with the maximization of one's well-being and physical comfort. The contemporary breed of artists and of creative minds of the bourgeoisie is the equivalent of that class of luxury servants that catered to the pleasure and distractions of the Roman patriciate and later on, of the medieval feudal lords. Then again, while the themes proper to this degradation find their most characteristic expressions on the social plane and in contemporary life, they do not fail to make an appearance on the ideal and speculative plane. It was precisely during the age of humanism that the anti-traditional and plebeian theme emerged in the views of Giordano Bruno who, by inverting traditional values, extolled the age of human effort and work over and against the golden age, of which he knew absolutely nothing, in a masochistic fashion and with authentic stupidity. Bruno called divine the brutish drive of human need, since such a drive is responsible for producing increasingly wonderful arts and inventions, for removing mankind further from that golden age that he regarded as animalistic and lazy, and for drawing human beings closer to God. In all this we find an anticipation of those ideologies that, by virtue of being significantly connected to the age of the French Revolution, regarded work as the main element of the social myth and revived the messianic theme in terms of work and machines, all the while singing the praises of progress. Moreover, modern man, whether consciously or unconsciously, began to apply to the universe and project on an ideal plane the experiences that he nurtured in the workshops and factories and by which the soul became a product. Bergson, who exalted the Elan Vital, is the one who drew the analogy as only a modern could between technical productive activity inspired by a mere practical principle in the ways of intelligence itself. Having covered with ridicule the ancient, inner ideal of knowledge as contemplation, 
The entire effort of modern epistemology in its most radical tread consists in assimilating knowledge to productive work, according to the postulates. To know is to do, and one can only really know what one does. Param et factum quangwert tunter. And since, according to the unrealism typical of these currents, a. to be means, to know, b. the spirit is identified with the idea, and c. the productive and imminent knowing process is identified with the process of reality, the way of the fourth caste is reflected in the highest regions and posits itself as their foundational truth. Likewise, there is an activism on the plane of philosophical theories that appears to be in agreement with the world created by the advent of the last caste in its civilization of work. Generally speaking, this advent is reflected in the above-mentioned modern ideologies of progress and evolution, which have distorted with a scientific irresponsibility any superior vision of history, promoted the definitive abandonment of traditional truths, and created the most specious alibis for the justification and glorification of modern man. The myth of evolutionism is nothing else but the profession of faith of the upstart. If in recent times the West does not believe in a transcendent origin, but rather an origin from below, and if the West no longer believes in the nobility of the origins but in the notion that civilization arises out of barbarism, religion from superstition, man from animal, Darwin, thought from matter, and every spiritual form from the sublime or transposition of the stuff that originates the instinct, libido, and complexes of the collective unconscious, Freud, Jung, and so on, we can see in all this not so much the result of a deviated quest, but rather, and above all, an alibi, or something that a civilization created by both lower beings and the revolution of the serfs and pariahs against the ancient aristocratic society necessarily had to believe and it wished to be true. There is not a dimension in which, in one form or another, the evolutionary myth has not succeeded in infiltrating with destructive consequences. The results have been the overthrow of every value, the suppression of all sense of truth, the elaboration and connecting together, as in an unbreakable magical circle, of the world inhabited by a deconsecra and deluded mankind. In agreement with historicism, so-called post egelian idealism came to identify the essence of the absolute spirit with its, becoming in its self-creation, this spirit was no longer conceived as a being that is, that dominates, and that possesses itself. The self-made man has almost become the new metaphysical model. It is not easy to separate the process of regression along the way of gold, age of merchants, from the regression along the way of work, age of serfs, since these ways are interdependent. For all practical purposes, just as today work as a universal duty is no longer perceived as a repugnant, absurd, and a natural value, likewise, to be paid does not seem repugnant, but on the contrary, it seems very natural. Money, which no longer burns the hands it touches, has established an invisible bond of slavery that is worse and more depraved than that which the high spiritual stature of lords and conquerors used to retain and justify. Just as any form of action tends to become another form of work, so is it always associated with payment. And while on the one hand action reduced to work is judged by its efficient in contemporary societies, just as man is valued by his practical success and by his profit, and while, as someone has remarked, Calvin acted as a pimp by seeing that profit and wealth were shrouded in the mysticism of a divine election, on the other hand, the specter of hunger and unemployment lurks upon these new slaves as a more fearful threat than the threat of the whip in ancient times. In any event, it is possible to distinguish a general phase in which the yearning for profit displayed by single individuals who pursue wealth and power is the central motif, the phase that corresponds to the advent of the third caste, from a further phase that is still unfolding, characterized by a sovereign economy that has become almost independent or collectivized, the advent of the last caste. In this regard, it is interesting to note that the regression of the principle of action to the form proper to the inferior caste, work, production, is often accompanied by an analogous regression with regard to the principle of asceticism. What arises is almost a new asceticism of gold and work, because as it is exemplified by representative figures of this phase, to work and amass a fortune become things that are yearned for and love for their own sake, as if they were a vocation. Thus we often see, especially in America, powerful capitalists who enjoy their wealth less than the last of their employees, rather than owning riches and being free from them and thus employing them to fund forms of magnificence, quality, and sensibility for various predos and privileged spectacles, as was the case in ancient aristocracies, these people appear to be merely the managers of their fortunes. Rich though they may be, they pursue an increasing number of activities.
It is almost as if they were impersonal and ascetical instruments whose activity is devoted to gathering, multiplying, and casting into ever wider nets that sometimes affect the lives of millions of people and the destinies of entire nations, the faceless forces of money and of production. Hia producto pere homo Sombrat correctly remarked when noticing that the spiritual destruction and emptiness that man has created around himself, after he became homo coamicus and a great capitalist entrepreneur, wars him to turn his activity, profit, business, prosperity, into an end in itself, to love it and will it for its own sake lest he fall victim to the vertigo of the abyss and the horror of a life that is totally meaningless. Even the relationship of the modern economy to machines is significant with regard to the arousal forces that surpass the plans of those who initially evoked them and carry everything along with them. Once all interest for anything superior and transcendent was either lost or laughed at, the only reference point remaining was man's need, in a purely material and animal sense. Moreover, the traditional principle of the limitation of one's need within the context of a normal economy a balanced economy based on consumption was replaced with the principle of acceptance and multiplication of need, which paralleled the so-called industrial revolution and the advent of the age of machines. Technological innovations have automatically led mankind from production to overproduction. After the activist frenzy was awoken in the frantic circulation of capital, which is multiplied through production in order to be put again in circulation through further productive investments. Was set in motion, mankind has finally arrived at a point where the relationship between need and machine, or work, have been totally reversed. It is no longer need that requires mechanical work, but mechanical work, or production, that generates new needs. In a regime of superproduction, in order for all the products to be sold it is necessary that the needs of single individuals, far from being reduced, be maintained and even multiplied so that consumption may increase and the mechanism be kept running in order to avoid the fatal congestion that would bring about one of the following to consequences, either war, understood as the means for a violent affirmation by a greater economic and productive power that claims not to have enough space, or unemployment, industrial shutdowns as a response to the crisis on the Joe market and in consumerism with its ensuing crises and social tensions precipitating the insurrection of the fourth estate. As a fire starts another fire until an entire area goes up in flames, this is how the economy has affected the inner essence of modern man through the world that he himself created. This present civilization, starting from western hopeds, has extended the contagion to every land that was still healthy and has brought to all strata of society and all races the following gifts, restlessness, dissatisfaction, resentment, the need to go further and faster, and the inability to possess one's life in simplicity, independence, and balance. Modern civilization has pushed man onward. It has generated in him the need for an increasingly greater number of things. It has made him more and more insufficient to himself and powerless. Thus, Every new invention and technological discovery, rather than a conquest, really represents a defeat and a new whiplash in an ever faster race blindly taking place within a system of conditionings that are increasingly serious and irreversible and that for the most part go unnoticed. This is how the various paths converge. Technological civilization, the dominant role of the economy, and the civilization of production and consumption all complement the exultev becoming in progress. In other words, they contribute to the manifestation of the demonic element in the modern world. Regarding the degenerated forms of asceticism, I would like to point out the spirit of a phenomenon that is more properly connected to the plane of work, that is, of the fourth caste. The modern world knows a sublimate version of work in which the latter becomes disinterested, disjoint from the economic factor and from the idea of a practical or productive goal and takes an almost ascetic form. I am talking about sport. Sport is a way of working in which the productive objective no longer matters. Thus, sport is willed for its own sake as mere activity. Someone has rightly pointed out that sport is the blue-collar religion. Sport is a typical counterfeit of action in the traditional sense of the word. A pointless activity, it is nevertheless still characterized by the same triviality of work and belongs to the same physical and lied group of activities that are pursued at the various crossroads in which plebeian contamination occurs. Although through the practice of sport it is possible to achieve a temporary evocation of deep forces, what this amounts to is the enjoyment of sensations and a sense of vertigo and at most. The excitement derived from directing one's energies and winning a competition, without any higher and transfiguring reference, any sense of sacrifice or individualizing offering being present. 
Physical individuality is cherished and strengthened by sport. Thus the chain is confirmed and every residue of subtler sensibility is suffocated. The human being, instead of growing into an organic being, tends to be reduced to a bundle of reflexes, and almost to a mechanism. It is also very significant that the lower strata of society are the ones that show more enthusiasm for sports, displaying their enthusiasm in great collective forms. Sword may be identified as one of the forewarning signs of that type of society represented by Chigul of Indostoevsky's The Obsess. After the required time has elapsed for a methodical and reasoned education aimed at extirpating the evil represented by the Eigen by free will, and no longer realizing they are slaves, all the Chigolovs will return to experience the innocence and the happiness of a new Eden. This Eden differs from the biblical one only because work will be the dominating universal law. Work as sport and sport as work in a world that has lost the sense of historical cycles, as well as the sense of true personality, would probably be the best way to implement such a messianic ideal. Thus, it is not a coincidence that in several societies, whether spontaneously or thanks to the state, great sports organizations have arisen as the appendices of various classes of workers, and vice versa.